Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is February 18th, 2021. We're here recording uh, at the Holiday Mormon Stories studios, and today I am uh, super excited for the interview. Today we are interviewing Chelsea and Nick Homer. Is that right? Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hi, guys. Welcome Hi. to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. <laughs> so good to have you. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know, uh, I guess, let's see, how would I describe Chelsea and Nick? Super cool couple. At some point, uh, you know, they were they were married in the temple, Bountiful Temple, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, at some point early in their marriage, uh, Nick has a faith crisis. Chelsea ends up um, starting an Instagram page kind of earlier in the days of kind of influencers and Instagram and she actually uh, does an Instagram post about uh, her husband in faith crisis as a believing um, member that ends up getting picked up by the church and even put on the church's webpage on LDS.org. Later, uh, Chelsea starts a support group on Facebook for women who either are in faith crisis or whose husbands are in faith crisis. And, um, and so... Uh, and how the story ends, we're going to make you wait to find out. And so, uh, what what we're what we're doing today is we're just interviewing a, a young couple who has gone through their own faith journey um, that that has uh, been decently high profile in terms of the church partnering with them for some social media collaborations, and then um, you know they've also made efforts to try and work through things themselves and support others in the journey. And so it's going to be just one of those multi-hour, heartfelt, authentic, real uh, Mormon journeys with a cool couple. So without any further ado, again, Chelsea and Nick, welcome to Mormon Stories. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Apparently we are a very cool couple. <laughs> <laughs> you are. All right. So let's see. How should we begin? Chelsea, I think I want to start with you and okay. your early journey, and then we'll we'll flip back and forth. Is that all right, yeah. guys? Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right, Chelsea. So how does your Mormon story begin? Um, I mean, I was born into a Mormon family and uh, three sisters. My parents are now divorced, um, but went to church every week. Very traditional Mormon family. Um, went to BYU. Uh, that's where I met Nick my last semester at BYU. Um, but Okay, really quickly. So your parents divorced... Uh, how old were you? Um, this was maybe four or five years ago. So I was an adult when they divorced. Okay. Okay. So growing up, yes, you were, you grew up in the Farmington Bountiful area. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of an intense place to grow up, right? Yes. Went, went to, to Davis high school, um, on seminary council. Uh, it's very, very Mormon. <laughs> and what was talk about the church and what it meant to your family and what it meant to you growing up? Um, okay. Growing up, I, I mean, the church was everything to me, uh, loved young women's. Um, and I think just having a sister at home at matched at church, like I just went and had a lot of friends at church and, um, didn't really perceive any problems, uh, at all. Like it was a pretty, uh, comfortable place for me and my family. Um, how was your family known to ward members? Did you guys have a like an image or reputation? Um, or yeah, I mean, they, family. I mean, I would be like the child that would bear their testimony every sacrament or fast and testimony meeting. So, um, and my mom, I, she was always in leadership positions. Um, and yeah, I mean, we definitely have a, a reputation of being very, very traditionally believing Mormons. What'd your parents do for work? Um, my mom was a stay at home mom. She's, um, when I was in high school, she went back to be a therapist. So she's now a therapist, but growing up, she was a stay at home mom. And then my dad, um, was job to job doing sales. He started at Frito-Lay. Yeah. So, and just kind of moved around Horizon Organic. Uh, we actually was born in California and moved around to like Arizona and Colorado, but, um, the majority of my upbringing was in Utah. Did you have a favorite uh, primary song as a kid or some favorite primary songs? Um, I'm trying to be like Jesus was fun. Yeah, why? Uh, I was trying to be like Jesus. Everything was about Jesus. Um, I look back and read my journals growing up in like middle school and junior high and everything. I'm just bearing my testimony every single day in my journal. Um, 
it is it is hilarious to listen to or to read (laughs) yeah um yeah i mean the church was my identity that was like our our second home away from home um and i had some really great leaders um growing up and uh i i remember like even my mom my mom was a little bit more relaxed of like Sometimes our extended family would go to Chuckarama on Sunday and I would have uh, like it would be a meltdown. I would be like for hours just be stewing like maybe I should stay home. I don't know what to do. Like just the agonizing that I would be breaking the Sabbath in any way. Um, so I was very I don't know if I was a pretty black and white thinker, but I definitely um yeah, definitely like a rule follower. Like if this 100%. is what the church says and if the church is true, then that's absolutely yeah, what I like have to do. Jump how high and I would go, you know, and so, yeah. um, do you, do you remember in your teen years either having doubts or questions or like trying to gain, like some people just feel like they always have a testimony. Others are like, wait, I want a testimony. I need to get one. So I need to read the book of Mormon and do my own right. promise and pray about it. Like what was your testimony journey like as a teenager? Um, I came pretty naturally. Um, and I don't know if it's because I was constantly reinforced with, um, being in like leadership positions in young women's and, uh, constantly like giving lessons and I would go to different stakes to like bear our testimony. So I feel like I, it was, um, I was just constantly looking for ways to edify my testimony. Um, there was no deconstruction process really. Um, Growing up, it was, yeah, I was very, very, very much believing. Um, and I would like read, do the Book of Mormon challenges. So I read the Book of Mormon several times growing up. Um, and I was very serious about my faith. So it wasn't something that was just like a second thought. It was my identity. Yeah. Uh, did you ever have any temptations to kind of break the rules? Or to, did you ever like have moments of straying or doing things you shouldn't or kind of like, uh, you know, guilt and shame things you have to talk to the Bishop about like any of that typical torment that some Mormon teens face around guilt and shame. Right. It was any of that part of, um, sexuality for sure. I definitely had obviously an attraction to men and I like boys growing up and, and I would like, even kissing, I would feel deep shame. Like my first kiss, it was like hours of buildup. Like his name is Tyler. And he was like almost coaching me to like, let him kiss me so that we could naturally progress as a healthy relationship. And, um, so after we kissed, I went inside and just sobbed. Like I felt like I was dirty. Like, so there was definitely a lot of physical shame that I'm still as a 30 year old, um, unraveling from, because it was, I mean, I remember the Bishop interviews and I just wanted to pass the test with flying colors and I didn't want to have to do any type of asterisk or anything that would be remotely seen as problematic. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of sexual shame. Um, and that you wouldn't have labeled as such at the time. No, I wouldn't. No. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, dating was really difficult in high school because I definitely had some relationships that we would like make out heavy makeouts and I would just feel sick for a week or two after. But like, I wanted to do that, like naturally, physically, that's something I wanted to do. But, um, then I would go to church on Sunday and I would, I don't know, get this like re of my faith of like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to make out anymore. I'm not, you know, and anyway, so it was just like not a healthy cycle. Um, and that continued through BYU and even through dating Nick. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Uh, any, any moments of doubt, uh, you know, at all, there, there, you know, any, any exposure to the types of things that would make someone doubt or question as a teen, you know, through kind of your seminary years that you had to face? Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I remember my mom, she actually had, um, a bad situation with, um, a bishop in the ward. And I remember she didn't tell me all the specifics at the time, but I remember her being very upset. Um, it was between my mom and dad. So there was strain in the relationship, obviously. And she felt that the bishop wasn't being supportive of what she wanted to do with her relationship was, was separate from my dad for, uh, for a little bit. And so I remember my mom coming home and she was just uh, really upset, really emotional. And that was at least one instance where I was like, oh, there's, 
there's a problem that I'm perceiving is inflicted by leadership in the church and it was hurting my family, but I didn't know a lot of the specifics, um, probably because she was protecting me. So, yeah. um, but like as far as doctrine and stuff, I, I don't remember having anything that seemed alarming to me at the time. I just really wrote off the feel good, you know, families are forever, uh, love, peace, happiness, you know, like kind of just, I don't know. Yeah, you were in. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, from what I know of your childhood, you had no reason to, no hang-ups as far as belief. Yeah. I, yeah. What did you love about the church's role in your life as a as a child and teen? What were the things that you really, you know, I talked with Janice Spangler yesterday about Richard Rohr and mm. first and half second, first and half parts of life. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all need a first half. We all need something to give us structure and identity and meaning and purpose. And, and so in that sense, whatever your structure is, there's value if you have a structure, you yeah. know? So do you look, were there things that either then or now you say you were really, really grateful for that were really positive for you? Or is that hard to say now? Um, I'm like in the heat of my anger stage right now of the deconstruction and I'm trying to see where my identity stops and like where the church is influenced. Like it's so interconnected as you know. And, um, but I was thinking actually last week, uh, my sister-in-law is the camp counselor for her ward and she came over and she was wanting to pick my brain about some activities. Cause I had served as a young woman's president when we were first married and, um, so I just loved young women's. I loved girls camp and I also, maybe I'm a freak, but I loved Trek. Now that I know how problematic a lot of that is at the time, it was an adventure and something that I like really bonded with my peers over. Like it, um, I actually like get emotional thinking about like, Oh, Ellie's not going to really go to girls camp. And I just I, there's just something about being in the nature and we were singing songs and doing crafts and going on hikes. Like there was just something that was, I really, really enjoyed that. And I, yeah, I, I, that's something that I will miss. Um, I also loved going to church on Sunday and just seeing families that I knew and recognized and, um, community, community. Yeah. The community was huge. And that's something that that was probably one of the hardest things to step away from was that feeling of belonging somewhere and people knew our family and, when we struggled, you know, financially, like we'd have people, you know, drop things off on our porch. Like there's just, it's, that's a beautiful aspect of the church and they do that so incredibly well. Um, yeah. When I was growing up, my parents got divorced in seventh or eighth grade. And, um, when I didn't always have my dad in my life or my mom, leaders kind of sometimes filled those roles and even provided kind of a semi-parental role during really key moments of my adolescence where I probably really needed encouragement or motivation or, or support or just love. Were, were there leaders that kind of did that for you? Yes. Yeah. Um, young women leaders specifically, it was the people that I think about now are all women, the people that I miss the most and the people that I'm like, um, sad for my children to miss out on are just few. Yeah. The women leaders in the church were such a, um, support for me and for my sisters and dating like it is confusing and and there was some structure and element of like people checking in on me and to s make sure that I was okay and and doing well in school like um yeah it yeah the w the women leaders were there are a few that I can think of and they actually I think a few of them unfollowed me on Instagram since all of this mm -hmm. and it has made me sad it's been a complicated yeah. grieving where it's like I just I want to honor that but also like I'm, I'm carving my own path and I, and I feel like they feel betrayed. Like they, I don't know, they're disappointed, you know, and it's weird to think that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. I can tell you're getting emotional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you feeling? I, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I feel like all the lessons of them teaching us that we're curious and we're brave and we're smart. And then I feel like I'm using those attributes and my decision has been to step away. But in that I've been like, I don't know. I feel abandoned by the community that I thought I loved so much, you know? Yeah. So anyway, 
Oh, Whew. it's all yeah. it's so emotional. <laughs> it is. It's so much good and hard all mixed into one, right? Yeah, it's just complicated. And that's what makes the grieving so hard is like I there are some undeniable goods, but there are also so many traumatic things. And I think about, yeah, lessons that I at the time thought, oh, this is good for me. I know this is good for me. And, you know, going on our honeymoon and stuff, I'm like so angry and livid thinking this was not good for me. This was not good for me. So... We'll come to that. And yeah. Just, uh, yeah. No, that's good. Any really quickly, Chelsea, thanks for being so vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I've got tissues under the chair, I think. Uh, uh, any other thing about your childhood or adolescence that any events that happened, moments that should be told that, that play really later into your, your faith journey, your faith crisis, et cetera. I just want to make sure we cover everything before we move to Nick. No, that's a great question. Um, I think the temple also was a really big thing. Like I remember going before um, early morning before high school to go do baptisms for the dead. I did that like religiously. Uh, it was the temple was like a safe place for me. Anytime I was dating a boy or trying to get answers about college, like I would go to the temple and it was always um, a very uplifting, peaceful place to be. And um, that plays out later with us deciding to get married and then also transitioning away so temple the temple was a really um and the bountiful temple right the bountiful temple yeah and there's something about bountiful like holland like a lot of the apostles have tight associations with yeah. bountiful f north salt lake farmington is that right there's, yes yeah can you talk just really quickly about like what what kind of that farmington bountiful area is like in terms of utah mormonism uh i mean it's very concentrated uh like in high school, obviously I knew that there were people who were not members, but in my mind, everybody was a member. <laughs> uh, and seminary council- In a high school of how many people? Uh, how big was Two, it? 2,000 probably. Yeah, and we had seminary council and it was just like this elite thing that you know, you're know you invited to. And it was like one of the biggest seminaries in Utah. And um, <laughs> like I was telling Nick this story the other day. You should tell this. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> For a seminary council, we had to pick a scripture and a theme for the year for all the students. And so there was a council of about, I don't know, eight or 10 of us. So it was fairly large. And we went to someone's house um, during or after school. And um, we all got together and said, okay, we're all going to go and read our scriptures. And then we'll come back and then we'll like brainstorm and pick out a scripture. For the, for the theme for, for the, the year. For the year, yeah. And so uh, we all went away. And I, again, I was so serious about my faith and very thoughtful. I was probably in this closet for almost an hour, just like praying and trying to figure out the theme because this is so important and this is going to impact students' lives. And, um, but I got nothing. I just couldn't come up with anything. I wasn't feeling the spirit and I was really confused. I come out, turns out everybody had just taken a five minute flipped through their scriptures and came back, but they were all just sitting there waiting for me. And I had been gone an hour, like really trying to get an answer. And I think that was just like, that can sum up just like my intention. I was very intensely believing and intensely, uh, I just, I really participated. And so I feel so mortified. I just told Nick the story, like the first time. I know, I just time. heard that, yeah. I was so embarrassed after that. I was like, I don't care what scripture we choose. You just choose. I'm just so embarrassed. I just want to go home because I could tell that people were laughing and kind of snickering like, okay, you're taking this way too seriously. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it's an intensely Mormon area and you were an intense Mormon in an yeah. intense Mormon area. Yeah. And I, I honestly felt like I was thriving. Like I got the, um, like, leaders would come up and be like, I want to set you up with my son. I think that you, you know, just like, I don't know. I just kept getting enough validation that what I was doing was right. And, uh, that I just kept going and it led me straight to BYU. All right. <laughs> so. Okay. A any, anything else? Nope. Okay, that, okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Nick, it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us about your, your Mormon story. Yeah. Early so childhood and yeah. Yeah, I, so I was born and grew up in the avenues in Salt Lake. 
Uh, that's intense too. Yeah. Talk and, about that for those who don't know Utah. Oh, well, I mean, it's it's been a while since I, I, we moved away in, in elementary school. Oh, okay, okay. But, but a very, okay. very Mormon community. Al- although I know that every time someone would move in the ward, they'd be replaced by someone from out of state. And we were always so just worried that this Mormon, you know, it, it's such a desirable place to live, I guess. And, and you know, every time someone would li- leave, uh, we wouldn't get replaced by another Mormon it's family. Not Gentile, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but very LDS family. Um, I mean, I remember, I don't know, three or four year old, we'd practice being missionaries and we'd knock on the door and my parents would let us in and we'd like teach the first discussion, my, me and my brother, my brother and I, Whoa. um, yeah. oh, that's and that's, intense. um, I don't know if anyone who's listening, I grew up listening to scripture scouts, Yeah, my kids. <laughs> scripture scouts. Yeah, my so kids. every night was scripture scouts and just list, like just breathing and Got eating. The dog. Yeah. Ooh. The dog scout. <laughs> yeah. Burp, burp, burp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we would wake up. So my brother, uh, was, um, uh, still is an amazing pianist and he would wake up uh, like five thirty every morning and play piano for, you know, practice for two hours. And then everyone would come together after, you know, having a piano, wake us up for the last hour or so. And then we'd have scripture study for, I don't know, 30 minutes every morning of my childhood. If we're on vacation, if mm. we're traveling somewhere, it's, we like, we'd go up to Idaho every uh, Christmas and we'd just be like so anxious to get out on the snowmobiles. And it's like, nope, we got to like read our scriptures first as a family. Wow. Um, I mean, every family dinner, like, you know, we always ate dinner as a family, but we would stand up and go in the living room and kneel down together and pray and then come back to the table and eat. Um, I, I think maybe in, and I don't know, the, the most interesting and funny story to say how Mormon we were is, uh, you know, like a lot of Utah families, we, uh, we'd go down to Lake Powell, uh, for a week every year on a houseboat. And on Sundays we would all bring, I mean, we're in the middle of the lake back in a Canyon. Uh, we'd bring friends and everyone, we brought our Sunday clothes and ties and everything. And we would get permission from the Bishop to do, uh, pass the sacrament on the houseboat. Hmm. Not only that, but then we would be assigned talks and we would give talks. Not only that, then we would break into Sunday school and then break into young men's and young women's. And we'd have a full three hour production on the houseboat. And we'd be in our like Sunday clothes and ties as like boats are driving by, like going out to ski. And I remember feeling that like, they must be looking at us thinking we're like a little overboard, but also I remember, uh, just thinking like, no, like we're doing, you we're doing so it much right. Pride. Yeah. Like we, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I mean, never once did I take a sip of Coke, uh, Coke. Yeah. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, <laughs> yeah. I should define. <laughs> um, anything caffeine. Cause Cause, just caffeine. caffeine yeah. and, and I think what Spencer W. Kimball uh, is kind of the last prophet who probably put a stake in the ground on caffeine. Um, but just very, I, I would skip classes in high school to go to extra seminary. Sometimes I'd go, just I loved hanging out in the seminary building. Um I'm trying to th- just very, very Mormon. What were your parents' professions? Um, so my mom has been a stay at home mom, um, my whole life. And, uh, and then my dad is in the insurance industry, life insurance and estate planning. Okay. And, and growing up, he was a Bishop in our ward growing up. And, and I remember thinking as a kid going and visiting, um, you know, widows in the ward with them thinking, I, I, I thought like, I think, is my dad the prophet? I think if he's not the prophet, he's, <laughs> he's up there. He, he probably meets with the prophet once a week, you know, and just feeling like we're not like not Mormon royalty at all, but we're like, we're very, very, just very Mormon. Um, important in your community. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was the, like all of our, our friends were church friends. My parents' friends were church friends. There, there wasn't anything outside of us being Mormon. We were primarily LDS and then we were homers. Mm. Um, 
That's how he described it to me while we were dating. Oh, yeah. First we're Mormons and then we're homers. And Whoa. it made perfect sense to me meeting his family. Yeah. But just very, I don't know. if there, And, and this bled into my mission. Um, oh, yeah. Never kissed a girl uh, and before my mission. Never would have even thought about that. And really? Before the, your mission? Oh, no. No, I had several opportunities um, (laughs) and just was like, nope, this is not. um, Whoa. Because of John, by the way, right? Oh, John. Okay. John, by the way. And uh, there were just these like talks that were recorded. There was one tape. It's called Dating 911. He did with uh, Wilcox. And I must have listened to that a hundred times. And uh, it would just, I don't know. I like it. I, I just what did they say? What did the Oh, it was just talking. It was basically a clever like talk show. They were radio hosts for dating nine one one. And like <laughs> people would call in and be like, I'm in a dating emergency. Like the I picked up the girl and her shoulders are visible or something like that. Like, what do I do? And then like, well, you can like and so it's it this like talk show. She's getting triggered. I, I know thought, I am. I thought it was really funny. Um, now looking back, I am just like, no, that was not, um, uh, anyway, uh, th- I was just very, very into it and it was my whole life. Did you have favorite primary songs? Um, I don't know that I did, uh, other than just all of them. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you ever struggle with worthiness? You know, doubts, shame, guilt, fear, no. bishop stuff, the type of stuff Chelsea talked about as no. a high school kid. I, I, honestly, and this may be too much, but if if you had put a gun to my head and told me to masturbate, I would have been like, uh, <laughs> like I, I just wouldn't have known what to do. Like, it just wasn't, I did not think about, I, I was absolutely attracted to women uh, and wanted, so I would sit and fantasize about cuddling as young as a a five-year-old. But I knew like, oh, like porn off the table. We do not, you know, just, I knew what, what the boundaries were. And I was a hundred percent dedicated to operating within those boundaries. So um, you're saying that you never masturbated as a teen. No. Is that right? No. Yeah. And, and there, there, Believe it or not, that was that was me too. Uh, I didn't until after I was married. And most people won't believe you when you tell oh, them yeah. that. Oh, like, yeah. That's impossible. That's, that's true. Happened. People do not believe yeah, him. Yeah. And I'm like, I definitely believe him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you, I mean, I don't want to say that there, there are plenty of people that believe and and still do that. But like for yeah. me, it was a matter of, no, you just don't, Those there's sins you don't commit. And that's yeah. just when you don't commit. Yeah. So you just rely on the nocturnal emissions, basically. Yep. As a teen. Yeah. And it just... I don't know. It, it wasn't even a, I was absolutely, I mean, I remember as a kid just being so interested in girls and my mom would tell you that. I just, I thought about wanting to, I don't know. Yeah. I just, I really wanted to be in a relationship, but I knew that that is not okay. And that part of me was very repressed until, uh, after my mission for sure. Did you, uh, did you ever have, either sort of that desire to gain your own testimony and, and challenges with that, or, you know, exposure to anything that would cause you to doubt or question and then have to work through that in no. your high school, high school years. No, I, I remember a few times feeling like, why haven't I had my, my moment where, you know, I have a Joseph Smith moment. Um, and then instantly going into like, Nick, for you to deny that you've, that you don't have that strong of a testimony already would be so ungrateful and blasphemous almost. And so I'd instantly be like, oh no, I know, like, I know every, the, the church is true and my testimony is rock solid. Um, and yeah, I think deep down I knew like, hmm, I honestly, from, uh, from studying the scriptures and, you know, like things like calling an election made sure and all like, I felt like, well, I'll get there at some point where I'll see, um, and, and actually have visual confirmation that my beliefs are, um, true. But beyond that, I felt like, no, I, I've got everything short of having an in-person tangible touching feeling experience that, that I just know that this is, 
uh, the truth. So, mm. Any other childhood or teen experiences with you or with your family that, that, that will play into your story later that you want to make sure and mention. Mm. I mean, it sounds know. like the perfect Mormon family, almost like Ned Flanders Mormon. Yeah. Ned Flanders for sure. Um, I'm trying to think. No, uh, so no my family mission, trauma. No, no. Okay. Not really. So um, kind of like the Mormon dream. The, yeah. The Mormon dream. Happy family. Oh, happy family. So like, it wasn't like your parents were like, mean or grouchy or angry, but then in public were nice and kind. No, I I think I grew up knowing that my parents' relationship, and maybe not knowing, but thinking their relationship is 100% about the church. And if one of them ever was, to, if they were to leave the church, that would disintegrate this family. Um, But they were absolutely both faithful and committed and just in and I, I knew like, oh, well, that's, that is, this is as solid a glue as you can have in a family. Um, and so, no, I, everything was great. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I didn't touch on my mission. Uh, yeah, go ahead and talk about your mission. Oh, Did you guys meet just, before mission or? Okay. No, a- right. after. Um, but I was just absolutely dedicated. Go? I was in Brazil, the very southern corner of Porto Alegre South Mission. Um, and just, uh, I don't know, I, I looking back, there is maybe not a minute that I could account for on my mission that I wasn't just putting everything out there. And uh, it honestly, my mission was still, I mean, looking back, I roll my eyes at, you know, the motivation behind it all. And I don't believe those same things, but High baptisms? That's about, like, was your mission a high baptizing mission? Uh, no, I mean, well, I guess for, no, the northern parts of Brazil are high baptizing. Um, southern pro- parts of Brazil, you have a lot of German and Italian influence, um, and and that probably reflects, I, I mean, much higher baptizing than Germany and Italy, anywhere in Europe. Um, but on my mission, not to... Um, I got there and was instantly very disillusioned that like there's missionaries who aren't reading their scriptures for two hours and they're not leaving at nine 30 and, and working all the way until nine 30 at night. And there's like before P day, the, the zone will get together and sleep over at the uh, zone leader's house and then kind of have a like group zone party the next day. And I was like, they would be doing that. And I would be off in the corner and reading my scriptures and it's nine 30, turn off the lights. Like I'm asleep and they're all doing their own thing. Did they make um, fun of you or did you feel ostracized a little bit? Um, there was a phrase, they would say, which is G H glory, those omens. So uh, the glory of men, like you're looking for the glory of men. And I was definitely labeled as that, that like Nick or Elder Homer, you're doing these things. You want everyone to look at you and think you're this awesome missionary. Um, and so you're uh, it for show. Yeah. Pride. Yeah. Or to become a zone leader or an AP or something. Um, but I, I was just abs- I knew that every minute of my life previous to this had been preparing to like getting me ready to serve a mission. And I was not going to waste a second. Um, and there actually, there was so for the first year, I feel like I just kind of got stuck with not super motivated companions. Looking back, I'm like, oh, they were actually pretty, pretty great companions. I was just uh, extreme. Um, but like our, our goal in the mission was to teach like 15 lessons a week. And uh, as soon as I became a senior companion and had a, a little greenie with me, we just start pounding the streets and we were teaching 40, 50 lessons a week and just had... Uh, uh, yeah, we were having phenomenal success to the point that our mission president kind of did a road show around the whole mission being like, look at these two elders, like they're killing it. And like, why, why can't, why can't we all do that? And, so the most baptisms you got in a month, baptisms in a um, month? Um, I honestly got switched around a lot cause we'd go in an area and we'd, you know, I, I think on average, uh, so the mission would do about a hundred baptisms a month. And that's 200 missionaries. So, uh, you know, a, a baptism per companionship. Um, so that first area that we just, um, yeah, we killed it. And I got transferred before anything really happened. But the next month there were 18 baptisms um, at like four or five families. And and then kind of hopped around the rest of my mission. Um, 
And so I, I didn't do a lot of baptizing, baptizing, but I know that I went into areas where, uh, there just hadn't been a lot of work done previously and really turned them around. And I was very proud of that. Um, Did you make zone leader? Yeah. I, yeah. I was, I was a zone leader and then was an AP for, uh, Eight months. That's the blue ribbon being an AP. I right? know, I know. And like, Chelsea, in the, you got your AP. <laughs> yeah. In the back. Oh, okay. She got her AP. I also, I remember going to a Davis basketball game when I was in high school and I thought the cheerleaders were so cute. And I was like, I'm going to marry a Davis dart. You were uh, like, I wasn't a cheerleader. She wasn't a cheerleader, no, but I, I married a Davis dart yeah. like Davis 10 years after that. Davis girls were hot. Basically. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, According to Nick, yes. <laughs> anyway, I, I just, uh, and I would tell so many people afterward that if you're, if you go on your mission and the mission isn't what you want it to be, um, or if, you know, there just isn't a culture of like working yourself to death, like you can change that. You can be the thing that changes the whole mission. Um, and I certainly felt like my dedication and my work ethic um, I don't even know where, just like my uber Mormonism, uh, it definitely made changes in the broader mission. And it, it was very faith promoting to see that. Well, I remember when I started dating Nick, you had a book of all the letters you had written home or was it your emails? My, my dad your, made it. And yeah. they were telling me like, I mean, I think a lot of parents project like my children are going to do really well in leadership positions with the church. But I remember that moment of feeling like they are projecting that Nick will, will do amazing yes. things in the church. Yeah. And that was like a seed that was planted that like, Oh, he will never <laughs> leave the church, you Whoops. know? So, <laughs> yeah. So did you, um, did you ever like, Oh man, I, I kind of want to serve in the church someday. Maybe I'll be a Bishop or maybe even a general authority that kind of, Oh, at, at the time I feelings. absolutely felt that, um, uh, I, you know, it's not something that you're supposed to like Aspired. aspire to, yeah. but I definitely felt like I, my commitment level was such that if I was called to one of those, to, you know, a position, uh, with higher responsibility, I would absolutely be committed and be willing to give, just leave it all on the table. So, yeah. Did either of your patriarchal blessings play a role in how you thought of yourself or your life? Chelsea, I didn't ask you this. Um, did you get a picture? Of yeah, and I did. And it was really long and it mostly talked about missionary work. That was, it was like a page full of missionary work and, um, talking about, uh, me and my husband having opportunities that would change the mission field. And so like, interesting, it was, it was really like a lot of, yeah, that very missionary mission president's wife. Someday, that's when I read it, that's what I thought. Like, and so it didn't say that, but like reading through the lines, I was like, Oh, it's probably something like that. And so then meeting Nick, I was like, check, 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 check. Right. Because coming off of his Indeed. mission and all of his reading his emails and stuff and the miracles that he was like witnessing, I'm like, this, this is it. You know, and so I think it definitely played a factor. Yeah. Patriarchal blessings are almost like tarot cards or fortune, they are. you know, because like they are. It, it's basically fortune telling by someone who claims to have power, yeah. and then you like, and it can frame how you think about and, your life. And then you right? have to go and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. How about your patriarchal blessing, Nick? Yeah, Did it my, shape you at all mine for it? sure. I I felt that there were, I don't know. I I fasted a lot previous to like pray to know if I'm ready to get my patriarchal blessing, took it very seriously. Um, and there was a point, there was a part that said, um, you know, as you, I, I can't quote it exactly now, but as you do these things referring to like, uh, you know, study scriptures and be faithful and just grow in your testimony, the time, the point will come where your knowledge will be made sure. And I, I w that sounds like a second, second anointing. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Or, or calling an calling election. election sure yeah. Jesus. And I know that my dad perked up and, and both my parents actually afterward were like, there is Tell a listeners phenomenal. What that means, Cause there are listeners that don't know it. Uh, it, it means, I, I mean, going through the temple, there is verbiage that says, this is all like the, the time will come where all of this is made sure and is like sealed on you like you're going through the steps now this isn't the end there's actually something else beyond this and i didn't know about the temple at the time but i absolutely knew that the scriptures hint in many in several areas there's kind of like a, a web of of uh, footnotes that all reference uh that, that there there's this point where 
you are brought into the presence of Christ. You'd meet Christ face to face. And and at that point, you have been saved and you are like, you're good. That's Denver Snuffer stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, um, oh yeah. And it was a much bigger thing in the early church. Yeah. Um, So you were thinking that might be, your patriarchal blessing made you think that might be in your future? Yeah, for sure. Um, And and I probably studied on that more. I mean, as like a 14-year-old, I was studing and looking into this and what are the conditions under which this happens and Polling if it, election yeah, yeah yeah so <laughs> um so that element of my patriarchal blessing made uh me i don't know just made me feel like i could go far or not i could go but like i like i don't know yeah you, you could, could be an apostle work. you could yeah. be an apostle someday yeah i mean it's a it's a small percentage of the church that would have an event like a, a second anointing so uh, yeah, I was very aware of that part of my patriarchal blessing. So listeners, one of the most important episodes of Mormon stories of all time is the Tom Phillips episode where he talks about receiving his second anointing and also Hans and Brigitte Matz yeah. talk about that as well. Yeah. So if you haven't checked that out, write that down, Tom Phillips and or Hans and Brigitte Matz, um, you'll want to learn about the second anointing. It's important. Yeah. So, um, okay. Any other thing about your no? Pedro, I spilled, Pedro blessing I spilled the beans. That's everything. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like you were like on the track. You were on the train to become that elite super Mormon guy. Yeah. I mean, no, I I'm, I was the, I know, like an absolutely super Mormon guy. I know everyone I went to like high school would be like, oh, Nick was annoyingly Mormon. Um, but yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, you come home from your mission and uh, take us to either of your. Let's just now jump in where you're both telling the story. Okay. What 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 ends up leading to you guys being together? I, I guess there is some space there yeah. for me because uh, um, I came home from my mission at 21, but we met at 26. We and got, got married, married at when 28. He was 28. Yeah. When I was so 28. Take, the, take yeah. the time. Just hop back and forth with your story. So yeah. Um, I don't know. I came home and went straight to BYU and was super, super in. But over the years, I can see I I just had so much fun at BYU. Provo. Um, yeah, Provo. Like we still drive around. And, like if we ever go to Provo, Nick's just like I love it. I love, Were you in the dorms? Yeah. So I was in uh, like Heritage Halls. I guess that was, I did a, a year before my mission, and then after that, I was just in the few streets directly south of campus. And we just had so much fun. So give um, examples of the fun you'd have. Oh, so like your best we built, so there's a girl who I home taught in a wheelchair and her wheelchair batteries went out. And, uh, and so we were like, well, can we have your wheelchair? Your insurance gets you a new one. And we put a couch on it and we drive all over BYU campus with this motorized couch. You can um, see YouTube videos of him, and he was, yeah, like, featured on the news. It, it was on, like, the Today Show and seeing it Because BYU, BYU banned it. So we'd drive it in. Because you were driving in, like, the elevator and yeah, stuff. Yeah, we'd go on campus, and BYU <laughs> want banned it. That. Yeah, it's, it's... It's ridiculous, it, Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing looking back on it. Um, but, yeah, if you YouTube motorized couch, um, and I have so many people until... Like I just started working a new company and I've had people like, Oh my gosh, like you were the couch kid. Um, <laughs> and your like favorite moment was when Mindy Gladhill used your couch for one of her she performances. She and CJ Jane, when they started the rooftop <laughs> concert series, somehow they, uh, found track me down and, and the first rooftop concert series, they were up there on the, they wheeled out on the motorized couch. Um, <clears throat> so that, um, I was just very into, um, I, like I, I spent a few years, uh, as the activities like co-chair and would just go for all reward? out for reward. For reward. For reward yeah. yeah. And this is the ward that I met him in. Oh yeah. What apartments? Um, condo row yeah. or not. Yeah. yeah condo, condo row. row. Yeah. Like Kensington, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Kensington. So right in the middle of, of condo row, which is this group of, of apartments. And we, I think everyone knew that like our ward is the ward, like for the entire month of, uh, of October, like we would have a first, the first week of October, we'd get all the family home evening groups together and we'd sort them into Hogwarts houses. 
And then they would get like three families here, three families there. And then they'd, you know, you're Slytherin, you're Ravenclaw. And I've never even read a Harry Potter book. So I was an but imposter. But doing the Harry Potter. But we would set up <laughs> zip lines across the street where we'd zip in on brooms. People were painting their cars, people, people, like, lighting one, fires Dan, in the middle yeah, of the street. Legitimately paint his entire van. Um, huff, Hufflepuff colors. <laughs> yeah. Hufflepuff, right? Yeah. I was going to say Huff and Puff, but no, it's <laughs> Hufflepuff. He's never read Harry Potter. So. Yeah, I know. And we, it was just huge. And then the next month, we'd do a huge Price is Right. I'd go out to local businesses, have them sponsor. They'd put packages together for like restaurants and dream dates. And then we'd do the prices right. And everyone would like, you'd get extra name entries to be called up if you came themed. So everyone, we'd get a huge, uh, like one of the big rooms at um, lecture halls at BYU. And everyone, like we we built a whole wheel and the Plinko board and everything. And we do a huge Price is Right. And people would go nuts. And then the next month we'd like. Like you bought five go-karts. And yeah, we bought five go-karts for Halloween and we were Mario Kart and driving all around the streets. So we just had. It That's was, just so BYU. It, it was is very BYU, BYU. entertainment. Fun. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and he had a really great paying job, but was in student housing and he wasn't in school when I met him. And so just a few of his buddies just had money that they could spend to do really fun things. And all of us poor college students were like, how are you buying all of this stuff? And you had the motor home that you would pack. We like, bought a motor home with a couple a of roommates <laughs> into to take to the Bishop's house for a pool party. And oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We, we just had the time of our life. Did and it you would, study at all? <laughs> well, I guess at that point I was just recently graduated, but even before what was your undergrad, uh, marketing business. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. It was just a great time and definitely just thrived within Mormonville. But I know that you- my parents and probably others were like this like trajectory of potential general authority, Nick is being slightly Derailed. tangented <laughs> toward like have fun party and, and, you know, part of that, Warren I felt party. like looking back. So my dad, if you know, like the young ambassadors, he was in the Tell first group. Uh, it, it's a singing, dancing, uh, traveling group at kind BYU. Of a show choir, elite show choir. Yeah. yeah. It so, goes all over the world. Yeah. Right? So apparently, and, I, and I'm sure I'm going to mess up details here, but my, my dad put together a group before the young ambassadors existed of just like, Oh, here's some guys he can juggle and they can sing. And these people dance and would perform for local businesses. And that group ended up turning into the young ambassadors. Um, and, uh, so I, I remember hearing that my dad and he would put together these huge events and just feeling like, Oh, I'm, I am living in the Homer legacy of just, yeah. Partying it up at at BYU. But your dad uh, was worried that your frivolity would, well, I, I think, and, and I think it is, it is true. Like, like on my mission, I was absolutely not interested in like, do I want to have a good time? No, like I'm here. This is the Lord's time. And, uh, and I think my attention was shifting. Like, I want to have a good time. Like I, I want to really like, yeah, we just, it, it was, it, it was something that could have only happened in Mormonville, USA. Yeah, it really but it was what kind of pulled me off from like everything in my life is about church. And it was actually, no, like we're just, we're having a really good time. We're being really, really good people. Were you dating at all? Uh, Casually. Yeah. I I mean, definitely I wanted to get married, um, but not too often. Intensely. Why weren't you (laughs) super dating? I think, I think probably a lot of it has to do with the overwhelming uh, number of options down at BYU. And when you you, were going on dates constantly. Oh, I was going on dates. But but it never turned into something. Why weren't you like, like Chelsea, why weren't you making out with, with (laughs) girls and, you know. Yeah, Nick, why? I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, I mean, there were girls that I dated, but I, I don't know that I had serious relationships longer than a couple of months, um, until Chels. And and I think part of that was, um, just having, I think a high bar, whatever that means, but just thinking like, no, like the person I marry, 
They've got to be the general but he authority's was definitely wife. Interested right? in dating because I I moved into the ward. This is the ward that he was doing orchestrating all this crazy stuff. And the first Sunday, Nick happened to volunteer to be the guy to take pictures of all of the new members of the, the ward directory. Ward directory. Anyway, um, but he came to my door like right after. Like he definitely was interested in pursuing. Like you were not passive about it. Yeah, you were I'm... definitely assertive. Um, yeah, I was very interested. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, the person I was interested in You're and the person bar. they were interested in yeah. wasn't lining up. Okay, you time. just weren't finding a good fit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was that frustrating, or you just having some? Yeah, absolutely. Fun? Oh, okay. Yeah, there was a moment near the end of uh, it, when I was in school. You know, you just you go to BYU, being like, I'm gonna get married, yeah. and uh, I just had this moment where at the time I thought it was you know the Holy Ghost or whatever, but just had this feeling of like, Nick, you will graduate and not get married. And I was like, okay, well, I guess that's it. Like he, <laughs> that's he actually okay. moved away to California for, was it a year? Mm, like half a year. Half a year. And then moved back. Cause he's like, if I want to get married to a Mormon girl, I've got to go back. So what yeah. part of California, uh, Walnut Creek, just, uh, the oh, Bay north, area. North. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I definitely was someone who always had stories about how I was pursuing someone and then, and then the signs, you know, like, I don't know, always had some miraculous story about how I saw a girl and I wanted to meet her and then did all this. And then I met her and like, oh my gosh, yeah. and, um, that just never translated in, uh, to marriage, which I'm so grateful for. <laughs> um, but yeah. So should we talk about your arrival, Chelsea? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, so we're five years apart. So he obviously was at BYU before me and so we kind of just barely missed each other and I dated a lot at BYU I had quite a few very serious relationships I had two missionaries um you know and the whole writing the letters and and waiting and it just uh I had so much anxiety around dating and the idea of choosing a life partner I mean that's just daunting when you just spell it out uh so I did a lot you of also self-sabotaging had the other pressure of not wanting yeah I imagine you would have like felt disappointed that your dad struggled. Yes. And yes. You're wanting yeah. to marry someone that doesn't yeah. follow your dad. There were definitely footsteps. things that, yeah, that, um, from my past and my family that I didn't want. And I'm um, actually like it come into our marriage too. I mean, parents obviously affect you. And so their relationship scared me and commitment scared me. Um, but I had lots of options at BYU and I dated often like just, yeah school and dating, but I also didn't want to be that person that just got married super quick. And I think there was a stigma. My mom just kept saying, you, you've got to go to school for an education. She really emphasized that she wasn't, she kind of would be like, can you just wait to get married until like your last year of BYU mm -hmm. or after just because she, yeah, she knew the importance of an education and that there's, I mean, she needed to go back to school and to start a profession, you know, later in life. And she just knew like, it's really important to get an education. So what were you studying? Um, so I did communications, public relations, and I actually did an internship for the church in New York for, um, Ooh, yeah, they're what? working for yeah, just doing public relations stuff for them. She's working in the building, in the building of, of the Manhattan connected temple. to the temple. And Nick actually came out to visit me cause we were, we had been dating then and he came for like three days. Um, and I ended up moving back home to try to figure it out with him. And we dated what, two, two years. Which is fairly That's long, a long for time. Yeah. That's not Provost. Difficult. Yeah. We both had, um, I think you would have liked to get married earlier, and I just had a lot of hang ups. Yeah. And my mom, as a therapist, had a huge packet of list of questions. You know, and I went through them. I even was like, are you gay? We need to like talk about every single thing. Oh, well, and, what else is on the list? <laughs> um, sexual stuff like pornography obviously was a really big one. Masturbation was a big one. I remember we had a lesson in our ward together where they passed around sheets of, and it was anonymous, but all the guys filled it out. And then they shared the stats of how many people were like viewing pornography and stuff. And it was alarming for women because like we were just like, this is... I mean, all the messaging we were getting around any type of self-pleasure was harmful, right? Yeah. So um, I know a lot of the girls came home from that sacrament or that Sunday school lesson feeling very scared. And like, if you're dating a guy in the ward, then you all of a sudden had a bunch of like red flags that you needed to sort through. And so I remember just asking Nick just endless questions about his childhood, his you know parents and uh, hopes and dreams for the future. And um, how he spends his time. But I mean, Nick just like, he was just so good to the, 
I, I don't know. I, I know marriage is a risk, but I thought having exhausted so many things that I thought it's going to be slightly less risky. There was no, yeah, no <laughs> curveballs coming ahead. Yeah. Yep. And I was very wrong. So. <laughs> yeah. So you dated a couple years. We dated, yeah, on and off. Like we broke up what a few did, times. What did you love most about Nick? And Nick, what did you love most about Chelsea? Uh, I mean, initially I was attracted to his energy. He was just like, he's like kind of an introvert, but he was also the life of the party. Like he was creating fun where there wasn't fun. Like he just made things more enjoyable. And also he, um, is just really smart. Like I love talking to him and like, he would just, he's very passionate about some things in engineering. Like he would just go off and talk and about things that I'm like, I want to be with somebody who we have good conversations. And so. I think conversation and energy were probably the two biggest okay. attractors. Yeah, and and I think Chels, um for sure was just, um, and it's this is sad that this was the main, but like the person who you are trained as a Mormon that you're supposed to marry, you know, the person just so, so good and the person who grew up going to the temple every week and and all of that, like that was, I, I know at the time I wanted to check off all, you know, you have all those checklists. So that drove me to temple attendance. Well, just, just like she was in, I'm fully in invested in the church. She is fully in invested in the church. Um, but also Chels is an amazing empath, which I do not have that strength. And it, I, I mean, one, like she was, when we got married, um, the, our first ward, she was the young woman's president. And she is so phenomenal with with making sure every single young woman in the ward knew that they were like deeply loved. And, and if they were struggling or having a problem, she would spend hours and hours and days thinking, how can I help that one girl? And that's something that I, I saw in her definitely early on when we were dating, that she is just so good. And I don't know, uh, absolutely just someone who cares and loves and wants everyone and like a social justice warrior. If someone is not being treated right, Chels will know and, and she will like figure out how to make that right. Um, but just in, I don't know, in so many, like at the time she was everything a Mormon would want a to marry. Foundation for our relationship. We both loved that. We both believed. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Was it hard? Oh, and, and I was phenomenally attracted to her as well. Let's say that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Still am. Good. Still am even more. <laughs> so was it hard to be good uh, when you're dating two years? Yeah. You know what? We did have some makeouts that we saw our bishop twice, but <laughs> I think it might think have been I, because I felt so guilty. But yeah. We did. Yeah, looking back, seeing what my friends were seeing the bishop for versus what we went and talked yeah, to the bishop for, it was, we did not need to see the bishop. But we did. But we, yeah, just to, I think so that you just, you had, you wanted to make sure that the I mean, temple, it was like heavy, heavy make out. We make stuff, out, for sure. for sure. And then the lessons that we were getting, like our bishop at the time was very like, don't do anything, don't lay on top of each other. And we were definitely doing that. And so like, there were things that he had said and then I knew that we had done um, looking back now, I really regret seeing him, but how'd the Bishop handle that? Was he, I think compared to the other people who were coming to him, he's just like, Oh, like, it's so good that you guys are here. Like, be careful, but like you guys are on the right path. You're doing good. Yeah. He was kind about it. Yeah. Okay. But just the very act of going in and like confessing things was really weird. Like I felt like I compulsively had to do that, you know? And, uh, yeah. Anyway, so we definitely, uh, that, that, um, set the tone for our honeymoon. I feel like of being shut down so many times. And every time we would have like a really good makeout or something like that, I would feel really, really guilty. So I feel like all of those moments, they just kind of like compounded on top of each other. And, um, that good girl switch of like, Oh, you'll just sw flip that switch once you step out of the temple. And it just didn't switch. So yeah. Or flip. <laughs> Anything else worth mentioning about your courtship or your lives before we talk about uh, your your marriage, your wedding night, the temple, all that stuff? No. no well, pre, I, yeah, no. Yeah. We okay. were just 100% in, bound to be a very Mormon couple. Oh, I guess I will say the answer I got to marrying Nick, we were off and on a lot. 
but I went to the temple, I think it was when I got my endowments taken out, that I had a very spiritual experience. Um, and that was kind of where I got the answer, where I got that piece of just like, yep, next to the one. And so that temple answer was really important to me. And it later came to be like a slap in the face when Nick, um, so he you, didn't denounce the temple, but... But you got the answer. But I got the answer in the temple, and that in was like... Temple. Once we're already engaged. What was the answer? That, that I could marry him. Like, I just felt so much anxiety and so much like, what if there's something I don't know about him? You know, all of the... Just feeling scared and nervous. And anyway, I felt that peace and what I felt like was an answer. And um, again, like, just the temple was kind of a safe place for me. And even with, yeah, getting my, like with my endowments, I know I had a lot of friends who had very traumatic experiences their first time, um, but I, I didn't. Um, it was actually really a positive thing, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that. Um, Why? Because now learning more about it, it's just weird. You know, like, it's like, I, I feel like I should have had red flags. Like, I should have had the alarms going off in my head. Um with some of the things and the things that I would be covenanting to and through Nick. And, you know, like there are things that now are really triggering for me, but at the time I didn't see it. Okay. So but I've you had a good, you had a, you're, some people have a real traumatic mm -hmm. uh, endowment experience in the temple. Yeah. And you're saying yours, yours was, it was really good. You love the temple. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you have a great yeah. experience? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then we got married in the Bountiful Temple. <laughs> yep. Anything you want, uh, your engagement or, uh, you know, it was all great. The oh, wedding, I guess I could itself. tell, I could tell how when you proposed, is that. Oh, yeah. I feel like we're, le this is really embarrassing and people are going to think less of us after if they so choose I, to listen. I surprised Charles. I mean, we were just, we were pretty up and down in our uh, dating and uh, pre-engagement. But I, I surprised you out of nowhere and flew you to, we flew to, you thought I was taking you to lunch. Yeah. And we missed the turnoff for like Subway. And you're like, Nick, it's back there. And then I'm like, oh, I'll just, you know, flip a Yui. And then like, Nick, you just missed it again. Nick, why are we on the highway? Why are we at the airport? And I'm like, oh, well, instead of driving around the airport, we'll pull in the parking lot because it's easier to cut through. And we were like in there and I parked. And I'm like, just calm down. I'll get you back to work. And you're like, I what are we doing? Now. And but, I popped the trunk. Anyway, we flew to California and did a sailboat and ended up on the oh, beach. And you, wow. and you this knew is, that he's just like just to propose, so just crazy. to propose, and yeah, maybe holding me hostage because he knew I'd. Rather. I know. I was like, this better work. But so you took he, her to a sailboat in California. Yeah, we found some like Steve the sailboat guy on. And he ended up talking about a sailboat the whole time. Nick was planning to I was propose, gonna propose on, on a the sailboat, boat, but he was talking about his boat the whole time, so it wasn't romantic. Like it we was were cool. just out in the water, and it was really fascinating. So Nick's like, oh, "I'll just do it on the beach." But we got a flat tire before we got to the beach, so it was dark, um, and we were just like walking on the beach, and then Nick um, kneels down. And you knew the whole reason we were oh, going to California sure. is that you I were going to get proposed to. So you're just waiting no for the way moment. It wasn't. Yeah. And then, um, I, I think right after you kneeled, you were, yeah, I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And then I I'm asked him to give me a blessing on the beach. Yep. <laughs> while he the was sun proposing. Was what type of blessing and why? Like of comfort. Um, and I'm so glad the sun was down and I'm, and so we're the only ones on the beach. But right there, I gave her a blessing and just told her that, you know, I, I don't know, but just a blessing of peace and comfort. And, uh, yeah. And what, how was that for you? Um, the whole thing was bizarre. It's just weird. <laughs> I, I felt sick to my stomach. Um, Why wasn't it amazing? Um, I think marriage to me was daunting. Um, and uh, I wanted a different marriage than the one I had seen growing up. And it's a risk. And... Uh, I just, I didn't know what to anticipate. What were you afraid of? Um, I don't even, I think just being disappointed or let down in marriage or feeling like we wouldn't be happy or that we would hurt each other somehow, like making mistakes. And and you were just a high demand lady in, in uh, Provo. Like you had a lot of people wanting to take you out. And so I think saying like, okay, I'm done with all those options. This is the person. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, um, committing to one person is not an easy thing, so. Yeah. But ultimately, you said yes, yep, so. we got married. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
Okay. So uh, anything you want to say about the actual wedding ceremony? And then, of course, I, I'm taking the honeymoon was a was kind of a big deal. Is that right or not? Or Yeah. I mean, it definitely was. Um, the disappointment was there. But uh, our the actual ceremony was, I mean, everything we kind of anticipated it would be. So, yeah, just what you would expect from a Mormon marriage. I don't think there was and anything then, noteworthy. <laughs> and, let, and let me ask, what were your expectations for each other and for your family? Like if you had like a, a 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 year plan, what was the understanding of kind of what you were both committing to? Because it, it's almost like a three-way agreement. Oh, absolutely. You're marrying each other, but kind of Jesus or the church are kind of like, the third party in the marriage. Yeah. Right. So what, what was, be, because I'm, you know, the dream's going to fall apart, but what was the dream, right? Well, yeah. What I, were the expectations? I think there was just so much, as much as you had your questions that need to be asked and all, there was so much that didn't need to be talked through because we knew, yeah. of course, we're always going to be devout members of the church. And that comes with a thousand other things that we know will stay constant through our marriage. Um, but, but we were a hundred percent, uh, I mean, no question, just um, that we were signing up for a life of an LDS Mormon lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that our kids would be. We'd have a family. Yeah, I mean, I had aspirations for a career, which I know some of my friends didn't at the time, and we kind of talked through stuff. But I, it was still like I'm still young, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we were definitely and staying in Utah. I think we don't. Didn't have really any anticipation to leave Utah either. Yeah. So. Okay. So just live. I mean, obviously you were going to be mission president, mission president's <laughs> wife someday, obviously. right? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think we were operating under the assumption that that, like, we weren't saying that, but like, we were going to live up to and become whatever. Live up to the expectations of being yeah. faithful members of the church. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So how long did the dream last? Uh, <laughs> and it, when did it, it, I think it, it died the moment we stepped out of the temple, honestly. Okay, so talk about that. Well, yeah, not as far as our expectations of being very Mormon. But I think I was anticipating that the ceiling would somehow, um, I don't know, not solve problems, but I feel like I would feel different afterwards. And so it's like we, you know, quote, saved ourselves and did all of this build up and work towards this moment and then walking out, I'm like, I feel the same. Like, I feel like yeah. Nick and I are the same, you know, like, yes, we have paperwork that something substantial just happened here. But, um, I think that was the first moment I'm like, oh, so like I, I was disillusioned uh, a bit, you know, thinking, oh, marriage doesn't solve problems and it's not all. You thought you just games. feel magically different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm sure some people maybe experienced that there <laughs> after stepping out of the temple, but I, Nick and I are both like, yeah, we're we're married, you know, and yeah. we had a very, uh, like, a we got married at, um, this is the place monument. So also another historic Mormon place venue. Yeah. Um, and then we went on our honeymoon and, well, I guess the first, the wedding night, I think that was the first time where we like really had to s grapple with, um, the lack of information that we had about our own bodies. So and why wasn't it other. amazing? Oh, it just, uh, or was it I, or? like, me figuring out my body, painful on your end. It was very painful for me, and I didn't, I didn't really know that that would be a thing for me. I, you know, and um, it was or at least as painful as you thought it yeah. would be. Like yeah. I think we all were like, oh, like it's supposed and, to be not comfortable. And I felt dirty, honestly. I felt dirty. I felt uh, nervous to be naked or be exposed around somebody that I had consciously made sure that that wasn't the case for several years, um, and it wasn't natural. It wasn't, uh, yeah, like I talked about that switch. It just, it, I was like, come on, it should be going now. And it just, it, I was really scared and I felt you, When you say it should be going now, you mean you Like should. I felt like we should just naturally just be like sexual beings. This thing that we have repressed for so long should just stop. Like we should not feel guilt. We shouldn't yeah. feel shame. Like we've done all of the right things in the right order. Like why isn't this happening? And Anyway, and you felt what? You felt? I, f I honestly, I just felt dirty and I wasn't anticipating that. Like I thought that I was told that that would go away because I had followed the rules. How'd so. you feel, Nick? 
Uh, yeah, it just, it wasn't, I mean, my whole life, I just been like, oh, like, you know, you hold off and hold off. And then it's just this explosion of ecstasy of a honeymoon. And I, I think for both of us, I was, um, definitely just figuring out like my body and, and you, yours and dealing with shame. I don't know that I was dealing with as much shame, but I was feeling absolutely let down that we weren't just like, I don't know. Just you, had, you had high expectations and it... Yeah, there was just a lot of unpacking to do. I and mean, Nick was 28 and you really hadn't masturbated and didn't view pornography. Like, I mean, that's a lot to wait up for. And I, I felt bad. He was 28. Yeah. Wow. That's and so I felt really, really bad and guilty that I was letting him down. Like, I could tell he was... Like, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. I could tell he was so sad. Like... He was let down and I could see the expectations recalibrating in his mind, you know, and that's, a, it's sad to let somebody down like that. And I couldn't control it. Were you sad? Were you let down? Oh, you were um, disappointed. I knew you were disappointed. Not disappointed in our marriage at all. Um, and, and I don't know that this is, I don't know. It, it just was looking back, I think contextually in the conversation of our faith journey, I see how much damage the rhetoric and just the narrative did to that week that should have been, you know, amazing this honeymoon. Yeah. Um, and so, but at the time I was just like, Oh, like, I guess we just need to figure out sex some more and, and, and intimacy. And, and, uh, so it, it wasn't like, a, I didn't feel let down by the church at the time. Uh, I did. I did. I said, I feel like I've set up to fail. Like I set up to, um, like this modesty, like I took that very seriously. And it's just like, you know, the garments, like, and I hadn't been wearing, and they had been wearing garments way longer than I had been. Like I, mine was just like a few months or a month, you know? And so it was just different. And I felt, yeah, it, we both left our honeymoon just feeling like, I just wanted to go play on the beach or like we went to Hawaii and any type of like going to the bedroom scared me. So I just wanted to be outside doing something. Nick actually was on crutches because he, had hurt his leg doing his water jet pack and yeah, thing that he was doing at the time. That a little company. Um, so we couldn't do any hikes or anything because he was on crutches. So it was like we were, f it, it was just a weird yeah. week that we both had so much build up towards and then just were let down. Yeah. So you felt really disappointed. Yeah. And so people are like, oh, when did the honeymoon stage end? And I'm like, it never really even started. Like, it, like we, yeah, that was the first hurdle. And it was just like trying to learn sex the same time that Nick was starting a company and draining our savings. And then a few months later is when Nick said, I have questions. And so it was just a lot that first year. Yeah. Um, I never want to go back to that first year. It was so bad. I don't think people can fully... So let's just say non-Mormons that are watching people that don't understand kind of an orthodox fundamentalist religious mindset, but it's like, what's wrong? You're both young. You're both attractive. You're both naked. You've got a week. You're in Hawaii. What, what is the problem? What would go wrong? Why isn't it just fun and you're exploring and you're having sex and you're swimming and you're getting to know each other. Why wasn't it just this fun frolicky thing? I mean, I know you've already said yeah. it, but I'm just... I mean, the brain is an important part of sex and enjoying sex and, and pleasure. And so that, for me, was completely occupied by anxiety and shame and all of the rhetoric that I was just going over and over in my head. Um, examples would be what? Uh, that, like... I hadn't ever explored myself down there, and I didn't want him to see so before I had seen. You, no, you, nothing. You didn't know how to... Mm -mm. How you worked. How Nothing. Yeah. And I hadn't even like looked my, at myself down there with a mirror. Like I was just so like, I didn't feel self-conscious about my body. Like I felt confident about my body, but I resented my sexuality and that um, also taps into resenting my body, you know? And so the brain I'm just learning is just so important into enjoying and having a good consensual experience. And that organ was tapped out well yeah and i think just like i mean my exposure was watching movies and like everyone comes at the same time and we climax beautifully together and then it's just and that just wasn't happening um and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask a bit of a, a tiny explicit question not for any period reasons just 
because I think it's important that we talk about this stuff. Yeah. So did you, were you able to orgasm on your honeymoon at all? That, um, like, I can't even remember if I did. I orgasm really quickly. Like that hasn't been a hurdle okay. in okay. our relationship. So that wasn't a problem. That wasn't the, the pain. pain. I, it was I think painful, your brain initially. anticipating that this is bad. This is not good. Closing up. And then like the first initial period of time where I was exploring, like with penetration was obviously very new. That, that was really painful. So the combo was just a really bad combo, but the actual like orgasming and stuff that hasn't been a hurdle. And and then if we're being explicit, like for me, he's never fired my gun. My gun was going off at all sorts of times that I did not want it to go off. Yeah. And so it's like, let's do this. Ah, shoot. <laughs> like, we'll try again in an hour. Yeah. yeah. If you're 28. Right? Yeah. So and, I'm and just, I never, never like, like it, that was a long time to wait yeah. and to be disappointed. Yeah. So, mean, oh, 28 years. 28 years. Yeah. yeah. Were, were you taught about lubrication at all? Yeah, we were given, we had a friend who gave us a bucket of coconut oil. <laughs> like a and little now, bucket. And, uh, now, anytime coconut oil, like cooking, we're like, oh, honey man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had your parents or church leaders, had you had any education at all? Um, Not from the church, obviously, but uh, my mom, like she, uh, like there were several conversations, but, and they mostly dealt around like, maturation related stuff and less of like the physics. And I think the big thing too was my parents, um, I don't want to feel like I'm like dogging on their marriage, but they didn't have a very affectionate marriage. Like I know their relationship, there was like zero affection. And so I'm sure that is a layer that I, that impacted that as well. But, um, I wasn't surrounded by anybody, a woman who was actively like owning her sexuality. I hadn't seen what that looked like. Um, and like I had taken like a BYU marriage course and stuff. And there were like, I knew like the basics of how things happened and come together. And, but I just wish it could have been a normalized conversation. Like every time those conversations were very formal and tons of jokes and tons of like sugar coating and going around the conversation that I just wish someone would have just been like, it can get kind of messy and it can like just Natasha Helfer Parker, like listening to her podcast, like really opened some doors, just hearing how she talks to her children about stuff. That's something I crave and wish that would have been the case. I mean, in Mormonism, it's such a virtue to make it to your marriage without sex. Yeah. And I remember even as a Mormon dad, even as a non-believing kind of progressive Mormon dad of teenagers, all I cared about was that my daughters wouldn't have sex. Yeah. Until they're married. Cause that's somehow bad and wrong like that. And, and I'm wired to still think and feel that way, but there's a whole different perspective, which is, wait, what if you are educated about sex in explicit ways? What if you're able to date and have sexual experiences, explore different partners, explore yourself, get to know yourself through masturbation. And then what if in your courtship, you're able to develop a healthy sexual interaction such that by the time you're married, you know each other well, and you do have a honeymoon, but it's, but it's beautiful and it's natural and it's fun. Like that is so non Mormon to have yeah. that mindset. But all of a sudden I think, Whoa, what if that had been our experience? What if that had been your experience? I, and I think early on, we kind of went into that mode. We're like, you know, honestly, we would not have minded if we'd had other sexual experiences outside of marriage because then in that moment, like it wouldn't have been this. Or even just with each other, like, yeah. you know, cause I mean the first while we were like, we we're not compatible. Like this isn't. You thought it was a problem. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely a problem. Um, with Nick obviously wanting to have sex more than I did with how painful it was. And then also I just had to unpack a lot and, uh, that was definitely a source of pain for sure. Yeah. Cause I was going to ask, why didn't you just sort of say, okay, it's our first week. We're going to be, you know, it's, it's a process. We'll learn there's hiccups, but we're just in this fun process of like exploring and it, okay. It was a little painful. Like what makes it so it was like, oh my gosh, this may be a big problem versus framing it as just learning and, and trying new things and we'll figure it out. At the time, that's how we framed it. Like okay, we okay. just had to, we just got to give ourselves time. Okay. But then like after four months, six months, eight so months, a year. Yeah. Then so, it's like, at what point is this? We're just learning. Cause it seems like it's such a natural thing for 
te- young teenagers who are doing it. Like, how come they can do it and we are not doing that? Yeah. So it yeah. was like, at what point? And I just kept telling myself, I'm learning. I'm learning. This is a, okay. You know, and, and at some point it was just like, Nick's like, this is like actually a, a, like we should really think. So of these this. problems continued for months. And, and mm-hmm. a lot of it, I think, is honeymoon was um, just hard. And then, this pain reflex was developed where you just the thought of sex is like, I'm tightening up. This is going to Yeah, Like anytime he would like just show uh, any affection, like I would naturally jump, like this is going to end in pain, you know? And so then I became, yeah. And so then I became less like wanting to like cuddle. Cause I'm like, he's just going to have sex after this and it's just going to hurt. So like it started to like affect other affection areas in our life. And I actually went to a, um, pelvis, pelvic Mm -hmm. therapist yeah and so i only went one time and i was like okay so i just started using my dilator more frequently and that ended up resolving some of the the pain issue and um but it was just really unfortunate that it took us so long and some of those responses had been formalized yeah yeah so Okay. If anything, maybe we're a message of hope to anyone listening. That <laughs> because it has gotten so much better. Yeah. But um, it's also hard because nobody talks about sex. And so I would talk to my friends and they were like, my honeymoon was the best thing ever. And nobody wants to say they're bad at sex. No one wants to come home from their honeymoon after making it to the finish line of being celibate and saying, that really sucked. Like, I, no one had told me anything like that. So I felt even more shame of like hearing other friends getting married and saying that their sex life is amazing. And just being like, yeah, same. <laughs> and then I go home and I'm like, it's so bad, <laughs> you know? Okay. And I just wish that more people, I mean, I know it's such a personal thing, but I just would have loved to hear it, at least from like two friends or something to just be like, yeah, it was really hard, you know? Yeah. Cause you didn't have people to talk to about. No, it. I didn't. Mormons don't talk about sex. Even like my twin sister, she was very private about her relationship and I didn't even know questions to ask, you know, like, cause I had an experience. She got married several years before me. And I was just, yeah, yeah, it's just kind of a lonely place to be when you're struggling, you're in the church, you know, with sex related stuff. And fortunately, I feel like it is becoming um, a bigger conversation with lots of accounts online. They're, you know, and great resources and podcasts. But at the time, I didn't, I hadn't figured out that those existed. And so I just felt really alone. Yeah. So is this a big source of sadness and pain for you, Chelsea? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it kind of ties into messaging around women in general in the church. And it's, it's all compounded into one for me. And it's a big source of anger. Like What's I, that messaging? Of just like, I felt like my purpose in the church is like a line in our family tree. And it was to have children and to, like my body was a very, like that was my purpose was my body in a lot of ways. And then also how to dress my body, how to use my body, what my body can do and how I, what I can talk about. Um, anyway, and then to see like, oh, I actually resent my body and I feel like I'm not able to tap into a healthy sexual life was really difficult. What are the messages you receive about your body as a woman, a Mormon woman that, that weigh upon you and that make lead you to feel those things like just tell her um lessons like about chastity were very specific and i was in young women's at the time of like the chewed gum analogy was being used it's you know like if you have sex or if you're sexually promiscuous it's like your chewed gum and your spouse your future husband will not want you you know and so it was kind of like my tie to eternity which is being married in the temple was relating back to my sexuality and um, modesty was a huge one for me. What does that tell us what that is? Modesty of like, I mean, we'd go to girls camp and our hemlines would be measured. You know, like your shorts had to be so long. Um, you had to have like the cap sleeves and, you know, the dance dresses, like our young women's leaders would want to see our dance dresses. And you, you know, in the Utah County, you would wear your dance dresses to church the Sunday after a big dance at school. And if it wasn't modest, you wouldn't be wearing a dress, you know? So there were just so many different things of, it just um, was all consuming. It was the air I was breathing. Um, And the young women who showed up to church wearing inappropriate attire, like a spaghetti strap or shirt or something like that would be mocked. They would be judged and girls would talk about them. Leaders would pull them aside. Sometimes you'd be sent home from activities. 
there are big repercussions for dressing, quote, immodestly at church or even at school. Like girls would say, oh, you're wearing that at school, but then you wear this at church. You know, like it's just, and the the leaders would reinforce it in the Strength of Youth pamphlet. Like I had that thing highlighted of, you know, the standards that we need to keep and how to kiss and how to date and what activities were appropriate and inappropriate for a date. Um, it's just very specific guidelines and it's impossible not to judge yourself or others with those specific measurements. And that, and that ends up harming you later. How? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure there are some women who remain semi unscathed maybe, but for me, it definitely affected, um, uh, the way that I view sex and the way that I view my, you view un- as, me, my, you view sex as s- with Nick of like it being dirty of uh, there just being a pit of shame of any time, you know, I'd get to making out, I would know my bishop is going to be disappointed in me or so my family. Yeah. Negative associations with sex related activities in general. Um, and your body, my body, my unclothed body is, uh, is dirty, is unwanted, is a sin is, um, mm. And you don't just shake that off. I, you can't. I mean, it's just like ingrained. And I know my mom even said at one point, she's like, "If you like, you could wear a bikini." Like she was a little bit more open minded um, that way, which I really appreciate. Um, but I was like, "Are you kidding me, Sister Burninghammer?" You know, would be so upset. And um, and I was like, "One piece only," you know. And um, it was just, I it was yeah. And then you have the honor code office and at BYU. And so that's also reinforced of how, what to wear and not wear at BYU's campus. And I mean, not only could it be us like church, the negative church repercussions, but social repercussions as well. And um, anyway, there was just a lot. So it sounds like just lots of associations with bad, with fear of dirty, of, of, of uh, negative consequences. And if you're, bombarded with those negative associations right. for a decade, then all of a sudden, how do you just start being yeah. a sexual being, have a healthy sexual relationship with your spouse, be naked in front of your spouse, right. do sexual things and not be constantly bombarded by those right. negative associations. And I hadn't really heard too many positive. That's the thing is like bombarding with negative, but there wasn't uh this counter swing of, well, sex is just so wonderful. Cause no one talked about how wonderful, like they would maybe make like a passing comment, like sex is great. You should wait, you know, but like there was never this, uh, I don't know, this feeling of women just talking about how they loved their body and their sexuality and, um, mm-hmm. liked being naked or, you know, like the one positive was children. And so that's what I associated with like sex is for children, you know, and, and that was the one like starting a family, you know, and I, it, yeah, it took us like a year to get pregnant with Ellie, but I can't imagine the hurt. It must be for people, you know, who go years with trying, you know, cause I feel like for me, that was the one positive association that I had with sex. Or that's what you told, like how you as a woman in the church provide value. value. Yeah, yeah. That's my value having... in our family. And so there's yeah. just so much, so much to unpack. And maybe not everyone had that experience growing up, but in our ward in Utah County, or I mean in Davis County, that's, that was the messaging that I was internalizing. So Nick, recently I did a podcast with uh, Amy McPhee all the best about patriarchy and how patriarchy can hurt men too. Mm-hmm. Were there any negative implications for you for all these messages about modesty and women and sex and shame or, or was it mostly Chelsea that was affected? Yeah, I don't know that I internalized um, in the same way that Chelsea did. Like, I think I was ready to like, okay, like, can't, you know, sex is bad or, or at least, I don't know. But I was ready when we got married to be like, sex is great now. Like, this is, flip the switch. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that. that it I really is with... the woman that has the burden in Mormonism of oh, like, absolutely. being pure of not of dressing the they don't talk to boys about and, how to dress. And if men have right? improper thoughts, it's the girl's fault for mm-hmm. not dressing appropriately. Um Yeah, that was definitely the message I was getting and that's what we would hear, you know, at combined youth activities. Um and also the number of activities and um lessons centered around this for women are so much higher than men. Like there's just more frequent. Like we were constantly talking about yeah. 
chastity and modesty and purity. Purity was such a big thing and virtue. Um, purity and virtue. I mean, those were just really important things for me because that's what I was hearing all the time. And you guys were doing nah, different lessons. We were talking about building, setting up tents. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're talking a lot about this, but I really think, you know, when they talk about divorces, it's sex, money, you know, in-laws. Like there, there's some main reasons why people get divorced and sex is one of the main reasons. And so we're spending this long on it just to make sure we drive home the point that for all the good things that I'm sure are associated with being raised Mormon. Yeah. The, the Mormon church gets sex wrong in so many ways. And it really has significantly negative impacts for so many marriages um, that it really is a plague it, it, and it. And we have to talk more about it or we're not going to learn from it. And so I know church headquarters listens to my podcast and watches, pay attention, fix your messaging <laughs> around sex. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else before we talk about faith stuff or other? No, let's. Uh, I think that's no. It's the all main. out on the table. So okay. yeah. <laughs> thanks for thanks for doing that. Really, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so when what other cracks start developing or good things, you know, whatever. Yeah, no. Let's fo focus on the negative. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I I think pretty early on. I remember one time. Chelsea doesn't even remember this. I what? we had been driving and we're coming in, walking in from our car, and I don't even know contextually how it fit in, but I asked could you ever see yourself leaving the church? And Chelsea was like, oh, like I could imagine a, a nightmare scenario where, and I was like, oh, like I cannot even, I think we'd been talking about someone who had left the church. And I was like, can you even imagine yourself doing that? And, um, and I remember being like, no, no. Like how could you even imagine any scenario? The worst possible thing could happen. And I would, we would never leave the church. But I remember you saying like, yeah, there's no, a I scenario. And I remember thinking like, should there be, should there be a nightmare scenario under which I would have to reconsider? And, and I don't know why that stuck with me, but it was around that time that there was just, um, I don't know. And, and honestly, it started out with just a few tiny things that are nothings like the, the, the seagull story that the seagulls came and that there was the crickets and, and that just swarms Utah, of seagulls came Utah. and, and ate all, you know, the were sent from were starving heaven. because the crickets were yeah. eating the And it turns out there's crops. like, there's like one journal entry about a, a woman like, Oh, and there were some seagulls, you know, and it just got, that's just been just retold and retold. Exaggerated yeah. in Mormon lore. Yeah. So, so there's that. There's the story of the three um, pioneers who carried every single uh, person in their handcart company across the freezing lake, and then they all died because of uh, their exposure to the cold. And then Brigham Young said that they would all be uh, go straight to the celestial kingdom. And it turns out, like they, I think they all lived to semi older pioneer ages. They didn't die. Yeah. Uh, at least not right then. Yeah. Um, and so finding these tiny little stories that I'd always just been like, oh, these are these are good faith promoters. Another another one that I randomly came across, and I don't know, I don't even know what caused me. I must have seen one of these and just thought like, oh, oh are are the other ones valid? But I I remember looking into the um, Joseph Smith Brigham Young succession crisis. And, you know, we've all heard that Brigham Young stood up and everyone heard, even though he was speaking, they heard Joseph's voice. And, and, uh, um, are you learning this stuff? I don't even like, uh, this is edgy stuff. So you're talking about when Sidney Rigdon, yeah, the, Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young are fighting over yeah, who the, takes the, over for Yeah, Joseph. I had no clue that there was any type of, but that I, I remember around this time, what is the truth? What's the problem with that There were story? just tiny little things. Oh, oh, well, yeah, that there was a lot more politicking going on. Um, and it's been a while since I've revisited that story. Let me but just see if I'm right. So basically the story is that the, the members in Nauvoo after Joseph died don't know who they should follow. Yeah. Signy says follow him. Brigham says follow him. And the story is that when Brigham stands up, the voice or the countenance of Joseph kind of overcomes Brigham and that signals to all the members yeah. that they should follow Brigham. Yeah, and that every and, single member had that exact same experience, and, and it was a no-brainer. And how is that not necessarily? And, and, uh, and don't later? quote, because it's been a while since I've uh, researched this. Um, but yeah, just that there was a, a lot more going on behind the scenes 
uh, and that that was not the clear experience for many, if not most people. Yeah, the way, the way I remember it, and there's a dialogue article about this, is there's no account of anyone ever writing that story down when it happened. Uh, yeah, yeah, and at the fact, time. in fact, it was years later, somebody tells that story in a general conference, and then it starts getting retold. Yeah. But there's no... and Just like these the other people, stories. And then years down the road, there's people that say they were at that event that experienced it, yeah. who we know weren't even there because they were on missions in England. And so it sounds like it becomes this kind of collective memory thing that almost gets created out of nowhere and then retold, but there's no evidence yeah. that the actual And Brigham right happened. before, because he's in the seven, no, he's in the, not 70. Brigham's in the Quorum of the Twelve. He's in the Quorum of the Twelve, yeah, which is much more outside of, of Nauvoo-centric. Yeah. yeah, and he calls a ton of people to be 70s right before that so that they kind of report to him and will feel loyalty to him. Power but, play. Kind yeah. Of thing, yeah, yeah, and I just had no clue. And, okay. and so there's, you know, and at the time, I, I came across a couple of these stories um, and was and they just kind of like, they just kind of got some gears turning. And I remember telling Charles, like, oh, you know, I want to learn more about Joseph Smith from not just church published books. And so I, I remember even like praying about it and feeling good. I'm going to read rough stone rolling. Mm. And, uh, and I remember telling you like, yeah. Um, this is around what year approximately? This would be 2015. 20, we got married in 2014. So probably the end of 2014. Okay. Yeah. Early 2015, okay. that time frame. Yeah. And so reading rough stone rolling, I was like, Oh, this is not the Joseph Smith that I grew up, that I testified to everyone about on my mission. What were some of the things you that surprised you? Oh, man, it's been, honestly, it feels like it's been a bit. Um, it's okay if you don't remember. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot. I just don't know what to go into. But his demeanor in a lot of ways, like he he was very, I mean, we, we talk about Joseph's like, um, he couldn't even sp write a letter at the time, but he's he spends his whole childhood telling these phenomenal stories about Indians, very much a, a, a storyteller and treasure digging, uh, things like that. Um, the, and then, I don't know, just kind of, it painted a picture of someone who's power hungry and vengeful and, uh, you know, polygamy. Okay, yeah, actually, polygamy was a big revelation for me. Um, that like, oh, it's, it was just Emma. Like, and I know, and like, I knew growing up that, that Joseph Smith was technically a polygamist, but I just was like, oh, those were all spiritual, uh, marriages. And so learning about, uh, Fanny. Meaning is it, no oh, sex, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but learning about the mechanics of how it happened, you know, with Fanny and then others and then others and Emma not knowing about this, um, and, and then and I started listening. Him lying about it. Yeah. Denying it. Yeah. And like marrying, it was it the Kimball sisters and then remarrying them in front of Emma so that she. Because he, he marries the two sisters without Emma's permission. Yeah. Then he gets Emma on board, but he, but he's already married these two and he's mad. He's worried that Emma might find out. So he has a sham marriage performed where, that, that where she's giving her permission for where in front of her. With her permission, he marries them again, not letting her know that he had already married yeah. them once. And other people are in on the sham of fooling Emma. Yeah, that's kind of disturbing. Yeah, and I apologize. I feel rusty on these. That's um, it, it's I'm here for you. Feels like I've just, I've you know moved on, and that's been a while. That but for for months, um, you know what what turned into. And I remember you telling me on an earlier conversation of like some of the numbers don't make sense in the Book oh, of Mormon. Yeah. That was a big thing for him, which I'm like I haven't really even thought about like just, the wars and the numbers and the Nephites and Lamanites and millions. It's basically millions of people dying in these huge epic battles with swords and shields and helmets and then there's no archaeological well, evidence. Yeah. And, and also whatever. Nephi and his family coming to the Americas and then they split up into two groups. They're having wars. People are dying. You can only, a small group of people can only reproduce at a, a, a given rate even if they're having enormous piles of babies and they're having wars. You're not going to end up in multiple civiliza two civilizations of millions of people in a anytime amount, in, in soon. In a matter of a couple, Even, couple hundred years. Yeah. So. And I just... Um, population growth doesn't... The math doesn't work. Yeah. So there were just things like this. And uh, and I was being very open with Chelsea at the time, which was 
I, I think the best thing I could have done, but not going well because, you know, we're having these conversations and like, oh, well, okay, let, actually, let me back up. Cause I'm, I guess I'm still reading Rough Stone Rolling and bringing questions to you. And you're like, and he okay. was plugged into like your podcast. Yeah. I'm, was that scary to start listening to Mormon stories? Did you know it was? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I knew I, who you were. Had I been excommunicated by this point? I think not? it was around that. Okay. So that's 2014. Edgy. Fourteen, yeah. I was warned, and fifteen, I was excommunicated. Okay, yeah. So I was, I was, ramping in right around then. But I do remember one thing that uh, early on just was a big nail in the coffin. I spent my mission thinking the temple came directly from God, and you know this is pure heaven um, content. And but it's you know I remember going through it for the first time and thinking like. Church must be true because no one could have made that up. And that, you know, that might, this, this must be straight from God. Who would make this up? The temple ceremony. Yeah. And so I went you through my it. whole mission every night. I'd go to bed and I would be thinking through the signs and thinking through the tokens and doing them on, like, I'd be laying in bed and being like, put What's my finger here, put my finger here. The second what token? am I supposed to mean? This, this is supposed to unlock huge troves of knowledge and you can't get into heaven without it. Yeah. So and I am it. not. And right now they just seem like dinky little passcode things that God will be like, what's the sign? Be like, bip, 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 bip. And he's like, great. You made it. And like, what? There wasn't like, there's supposed to be a lot of meaning here. And, and so I had spent so much time and I had assigned a lot of value to those, you know, like they had over time repeating and thinking through them. Like, you know, my finger in this place means this. And that is very profound for me. And then I, uh, I remember learning about the history of the endowment and that there are, um, oaths uh, and self-harming, um, actions that you take and realizing that a lot of the, a lot of the value that I had assigned to certain hand movements, that those did not mean what I had, what I had caused them to mean in my mind that they were just relics of something that is absolutely horrifying, slitting your throat, pulling, uh, like, I, I want to go too graphic, but for, for those who don't know, we're talking about holdovers from the Masonic Lodge temple ceremony where you would make actions of slitting your throat or disemboweling yourself. Yeah. And this is how it was when I went through the Mormon temple, they yeah. changed it between what I went through and when you went through, they changed it in 1990. But if you want to go on the temple, you can Google, uh, YouTube, you can Google it and you can see the motion you'd make to slit your own throat or to cut out your own heart or to disembowel yourself. Yeah. And it was super disturbing, but was doubly disturbing was that it was just Joseph was a Mason. He learned all this as a Mason in Nauvoo in the secret Mason temple ceremony. And then he just brought that into the Mormon endowment ceremony. So that makes you, well, is this divine or is this just something he copied and pasted from another yeah. secret? And it's so violent. And then you look, why, and then it's, why is it changing? Because you think that the temple ceremony is a revelation from God. And then you find out they're just, oh, got a little social pressure. Okay, let's take a couple things out. Oh, we got yeah. a little more social pressure. Let's take a more. So they're editing it. It's, it's, it's plagiarized from somewhere else. It's graphic. It's violent. All those things can be really traumatic. Yeah. Is that right? I don't, I don't mean to tell you. Yeah. Story well, you, yeah. And, and it was just learning that that is the history of these signs. And I threw so much effort on my part and spiritual confirmations and feeling this. I think that was a moment where I was like, oh, like I can't, tr I can't trust can the trust revelation that I'm receiving. Yeah. And, and feeling based revelation because, um, Feelings are not the best way to determine whether something is right or not. They can be a great way of determining, is this good for me? Um, but whether something is true or not, or uh, I don't know, feelings. I, that's why I started to realize that everything that I've known so solidly my whole life, uh, I'm finding additional information that's making me wonder, did I know those things? And so I, I think looking back, I can see that even when we got married, there were things on my shelf that I was, that I could not have even acknowledged me if you'd asked me point blank about them. Um, but they were there and, and just, yeah, these cracks start coming and, and, and then all, all this was getting dumped on shelves. Yeah. I wonder if like the act of going, getting married in the temple, like you had subconsciously given yourself permission to 
explore that because I feel like before we got married, if you would have told me these things, oh. I I would have been like, I'm running. You yeah, know? and, and so. I absolutely knew. Like, if I leave the church, um, or if I even had questions, not that I was considering having questions at the time, but like that yeah. would end it for this relationship and for my future with anyone in the temple. So Chelsea, let's hear from your point of view. What's it like when you're like, you had your dad who struggled, you had your parents that struggled, you held out for like the perfect Mormon guy, you found the perfect Mormon guy, he checks right. all the boxes, you get married, you have kind of the sexual discomfort and shame and guilt, and now all of a sudden the perfect Mormon guy starts reading Rough Stone Rolling, listening to like potentially sketchy podcasts and super coming, sketchy. <laughs> coming, <laughs> hey, watch it. And then starts uh, coming to you with doubts and questions. Tell the story from your perspective. Well, I, I mean, it started out little, like he just, I don't know if he was softballing it. I'm not, I, I, I mean, this was at the beginning. He just said, I have some questions. Like, are you comfortable with me exploring? And I appreciated that gesture. Um, and I said, of course, like my, I feel like my mom laid this foundation of like, we don't need to fear doubt, like questions are good. And um, so I just didn't even think anything of it. And I was serving as young woman's president at the time in our ward. And I was just at the church all the time and um, just doing activities with the girls. It was, we only had like maybe seven, eight girls, but um, it was a lot. Like I spent a lot of time with the girls. Um, and anyway, so it was weird because I was like, really amping up my participation in church and I would come home and I could see Nick was welding stuff often for his, um, water jet pack company that he was starting at the time. And he was always plugged in probably to your podcast. Um, yeah. and he was always plugged in and, and, um, between our conversations, like every week, like big jumps would be happening. And it was really alarming. Cause I, you know, at some point I was just like, okay, he would say something about Joseph Smith. And I would say, oh, I didn't know that. Or I don't, I can't really explain why that is. And he told me about the temple because that was such a big thing for him. And I was like, I, I didn't know that. Like that's, that is really troubling. You know, I was trying to be empathetic and validating, but also keep myself at a distance. Cause like, I didn't want to unravel as I was watching him do it. Um, and I remember one conversation we had, this was like, and the duration of a year about our first year anniversaries when he was like this, I, this doesn't resonate with me. I don't believe. By two, 2015, he's like, I don't believe yeah. anymore. Yeah. So it full was blown. full blown. It happened so fast. It was just unraveling. And I was just watching and I was, I was scared, but also like, it's kind of a shameful thing that I didn't talk to anybody about it. I was just, we would just go home and like in our apartment and then, and he would just be like unraveling. And he was obviously angry and confused and, you know, all of the feelings of feeling like he was lied to or, you know, f just felt betrayed. And, um, but he was very tactful. Like he didn't take it out on me. And I think that was a gift that if, I think if he would have, I, our trajectories probably would have been very different. Yeah, yeah. And I just fully realized that like, I'm the one who's messing stuff up. At one I, point, you know, and I was just like crying and really confused because we had a conversation of like, okay, if God can be on the table, we can make this work out. If you don't like Joseph Smith, that's okay. We can like focus on God. And he's like, well, I, I just don't know if I believe in God, you know, and that's like huge. That, yeah. That's a huge heavy hitter. And I was just like, okay, I don't know how this is going to work. So what was that like for you emotionally? I, I mean, I was... I your, just, your Mormon dreams unraveling. Oh, for in sure. I was one. like, we just, our marriage is awful. Like divorce <laughs> was for sure on the table. We talked about it. One well, year in. Yeah. And, and Nick, um, was, he did come to me and he's like apologetic. I mean, I know that he kind of like is a victim in this of his, he was unraveling, but like, he was like, I realized I changed our LDS plan. Like we had this lifestyle that we both signed up for. We had like signed that contract essentially. And I'm the one changing it. I know that I'm changing it. Um, and he's like, if you want to get out of this marriage, like I support that. Ugh. Or I won't hold you. Like I, yeah. He's I've like, just... I want this to work. I want to stay married to you, but I know that I've changed it substantially enough that if you don't, I support that. And that was just like a little olive branch to me where I'm like, okay, he's not out to get me. And that's when I started to strip away like him attacking or 
deconstructing the church wasn't deconstructing me. You know, like I had to separate myself from the church and watch him deconstruct, but he wasn't deconstructing his relationship with me. And so we had a very frank conversation about we want to stay married or try to make this work at least. So why did you want, so there are spouses that just say, huh, uh, no, this, the deal is church or nothing. So like, it's either you stay in the church or I'm, I'm out of here. Why weren't you, especially because you had had other bumps, right? why weren't you just, I'm, I'm done, <laughs> I'm out. Honestly, um, the narrative and the stories I've told myself growing up of why people leave the church are they're like deceived, they're wanting to sin, they're evil. Like Nick hadn't changed, his personality was, I mean, he was obviously grieving, which I could sense, but he was still the same man I married and I, I knew that, and uh, and he was starting to, like, I would go to ward council, and they would talk about Nick, you know, because they talk about people in the ward, and, and Nick would come up, and people saying, like, the light has gone from his eyes, or maybe we oh. should make him an assignment to get him, like, they could just perceive that there was a something happening on his end, and just watching, like, and hearing what people would say about Nick, but then going home, and I'm like, well, Nick isn't, like, me like he's not mean or he's not wanting to sin like I could tell he was like really intensely trying to figure out what was going on and a big thing was the support group in Salt Lake the faith again meetup talk about that so Nick did you go before without me one time with yeah so I went so tell I us had what it is and how you heard about it. so it, um it's a group of um I, I guess every month they get together and they'll have someone from Tom like Griffith. Is that right? Is that who's yeah, the Griff, yeah. There is there's Jay Jay Griffith. Jay Griffith. Is that right? I, it's been a bit as well. I so apologize. He has a group. He meets holidayish Mill Creek uh -huh. area. Yeah, and I can't tell you where they're. I bet they're not meeting right now okay. uh, with COVID. Uh, but people... I still get emails that they're doing virtual events. But it's, it's basically a group that once a, a month they'll have someone present. Um, and kind of like a Sunstone-ish crowd, uh, someone from the, ch the church history department will talk about, uh, I or don't Tom know. Tom Christofferson was a, a guest yeah, speaker. Uh -huh. Faithful, intellectual Mormons. Yes. Yeah. People who tried are to also make it work, struggling. but couldn't talk about hard things in Sunday school. So they went had a place like this to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what I, I, and I don't know that I could give you the best pitch for what the group is other than. It, it was a room full of very thoughtful people who it seemed like had dealt with these issues and had had to really drag themselves through, you know, this an ugly realization that what everything that they knew wasn't everything wasn't, you know, just clean and pretty. And this like is like a wide range of individuals. Like, so Nick took me the second time and said, I think you might be interested because I was still kind of grappling what? Well, let, let me tell the first time I went was Thomas Worthlin McConkie, mm -hmm. and he had just written the book, uh, Navigating Mormon Faith Crisis. And he started out and did a meditation, uh, 10 minutes, and then uh, just talked through the Mormon uh, or, or uh, adult development stages and how that um, just syncs really well with, with the uh, faith transition. And I just felt. I felt like I was among kindred spirits and I, f I just felt the spirit or what I wouldn't have called it the spirit, but just, I felt so at home and understood and validate. And that these were like people who were leaving the church or struggling with the church or just struggling with information aren't bad people. These are, these are the cream of the crop and they're really good people. And so, yeah, I, I remember coming back, to you and telling you it's like that was like top five one of the most spiritual experiences that I've had and so him giving that he pitch said that to you to me yeah because he came home and and you read the book his, Thomas's book and yeah. you were just like he he was just raving about it and so I said I want to go with you next time because I definitely needed I could sense that I needed a little bit more of that empathy because I my only exposure to someone really actively deconstructing was Nick um so we went, and I don't even remember who the guest speaker was. It didn't really matter, honestly, because I was just sitting in the back of the room with Nick, and then I just saw, like, just so many people, and I'm like, this is so much bigger than Nick. And people were asking very thoughtful questions, and they were, like, grandparents who were trying to make it work for their adult children, and there were, you know, people our age. There are people who are raising small children. Like, I, it just completely obliterated what I had, the narrative I created about people who were struggling, like, completely. Like, it was just, like, the most... What's making you feel emotional? 
I just, I'm just so grateful that people create spaces, you know, and people have podcasts like you, like create a place where people can explore the struggle and, and find humanity, you know, and, uh, that was such a gift to Nick. And then Nick in turn gave that gift to me. And I, at the time I didn't feel like it was a gift. You know, I was still really angry that he was sabotaging our family, but you know, it was, it was a big moment, a very clear moment for me that I was like, wow, there's something here that I need to learn. And, and to rewind, I think you asked, um, how did Chels go through all of this and not get defensive and say like, whoa, you're changing the agreement. I'm out. out. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the answer is that Chels cares. Chels is an incredible empath. And she, when she sees someone hurting, she more than defending herself, she wants to find out why that person's hurting, even if the facts behind why that person is hurting is hurtful to you. I don't want to take away. Like I was very defensive. Like we fought a lot. Like our neighbors uh, probably heard a lot (laughs) as we were trying to set boundaries. Cause Nick would just like, as he, as I started to empathize a little bit more, you know, then he would feel more comfortable of like, well, did you know this? Or like, maybe you should read this. And sometimes it was a fire hose. And you know, when you'd feel what, and I would feel defensive and I would feel like I could feel myself shifting. You know, I could feel like my testimony, like I was still in young women's and I was bearing my testimony like every single Sunday basically. And it was changing. And I was so, slowly like the lessons I was like, I felt like restricted. Like I couldn't talk as openly as I had once been able to. And my testimony just became more and more generic. Like it was more like, I love you and I just want you to be happy. You know, and it was never like, please stay. And actually quite a few of the young women um, have left the church. And it's been interesting, a, an interesting dynamic since. Um, so your lessons to the young women got generic. Got because more you generic. you started the question? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, I can't teach this lesson on Joseph Smith. Like after like talking to Nick about some things, like I was like, I need to do more research and I don't want to teach someone something that I don't know for sure without like researching. And, and I knew like, you know, when you know there's... Like the year of polygamy podcast, I held off on that for years because I knew if I listened to that, it would hurt so bad. Um, anyway, so I just like, I, I held it off because I just knew if I did that, it would hurt and I would unravel, you know, and it's a weird place to be, to like know that there's stuff you don't know. And if you do happen to go in that room, that it could shift things drastically. And you were holding off why? Say it again. The church was everything, the community, belonging. Um, I had really good experiences that, quote, I could not deny. You know, there's just a lot that was, my roots were in the church. And what the, did you fear? I, if you lost, if you let your guard down. I didn't know life fear. outside of the church. I didn't know that, I don't know. And, and I didn't know this, what to fear. You became like <laughs> the anchor in our family and our future potential children like now that yeah. I'm out, you're the only thing that's... This kind of goes into like when we started telling family and I know there was the idea of like, okay, well, the children are on you now. Like you, if you leave, the whole family will be wiped off. You the know, family the family tree. You that? They put the pressure on you again? Yeah. I think it, it was, it, the intentions were good, but yes, it was like you, if you leave the church, the whole family will be gone, you know? And so there's also the added pressure of like, I don't want to disappoint people around me, you know? Yeah. Marriage is hard enough. Like marriage is hard for everyone. Yeah. You're dealing with all this the sexual stuff and then all this faith stuff. That's, and it's your first year of marriage. That's a lot. Yeah. 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 It was a lot. And, and new job and you're building a career, right? Yeah. So we were traveling around the country doing boat shows and stuff. And anyway, that first year was really hard. And I don't want to say like, it's easy to go in hindsight and be like, Oh, but you know, I empathized and it was like, it was hard. Like we fought a lot and I don't want to minimize that because we were trying to set boundaries and I didn't really know another mixed faith couple that was making it work. And so I didn't know what it looked like. And so we were trying to figure that out. Yeah. So, and then comes, yeah. I don't know if we want to talk about telling family or children or what's next. What is next? I guess we, we stayed quiet about it for a while. And then we kept going to Nick's family's house and we would kneel to pray. And inside their house, his family's house is like a temple. It's a temple. And so I felt like an imposter. We would go to family dinners and Nick here, he's like, I don't believe in God. No one in his family knew anything about it. And I would just go feeling like, 
we're lying. We're lying to them. So you didn't want to come out to your parents. Well, uh, yeah, and I was fine just being like, this is my thing, and yeah. I'm keeping it to myself. But more and more, I kept realizing how this is affecting Chels, that people would ask, like, what's your husband's calling? Or just just random little things where Chels kept feeling like she had to cover up for well, me. Well, I kept feeling like this is Nick's story to tell, but really it was my story to tell, too. Yeah. Like, it, we are married, and being in a mixed faith marriage, like, I felt abandoned in a lot of ways. And I didn't have support. And so I said, Nick, you need to tell somebody so I can tell somebody. Can I back up just yeah. for a second? Yeah. So like I'm a parent, I have four kids. And I think like now as I'm trying to learn about what it means to be a healthy parent, I realize that the number one thing I want, the number one indicator that I'm a healthy parent, a good parent is if my kids tell me everything. Like if my kids will tell me everything about what's going on in their lives, the good and the bad, the hard and the good, then I know I'm making them feel safe, making them feel comfortable that we have emotional intimacy. That's how I measure. And so I just want to contrast that with the idea that like your parents love you, Nick, you're in this super tight knit family. Family is everything. You've got the gold star, five star Mormon family. You're going through a earth shattering, the most difficult Thing you probably had ever experienced up yeah. until that point in your life, the biggest dramatic explosion of sadness ever in a first year of marriage. And your reaction is, I can't talk to my family. Like, what is that? What is that? Yeah, I mean, or, or can't talk to anyone. Well, um, first you're Mormon and then you're Homer. So I'm sure that adds a layer of. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And talking to anyone, it's not just like, oh, this is like embarrassing. I want, like, it would ruin their day and month and years if I bring this up to what them. What were you afraid would happen if you talked to your parents? Oh, absolutely. It would just, it would be devastating to for them. them. To them. Devastating to them. Yeah. That's not all, but okay. Oh, I, I mean, devastating for me. I, I, I don't know. It's just this severing of like every, cause I look back through my whole life of mission and seminary and scriptures. And it was all like, I knew that that's what was expected and that that's what a good Mormon boy does. And a lot of that, I, I realized looking back that I got a little bit of a high of every time someone would be like, well, the expectation is we don't drink caffeine. And I'm like, I'm going to do that so well. I won't even know what caffeine, you know, looks like or like whatever. And like, I really like you gave me that expectation and I, I feel like I met it. And then this is just, I don't know, being public about this is like, oh, and I've fallen completely from every expectation you've ever had. Yeah. So there's the fear of disappointing them. And, and so many Mormon parents will blame themselves. How did I fail? What did I do wrong as parents? So kids, so I mean, this is, this is where we get in the territory of unhealthy organizations. I don't like to use the word cult on Mormon stories. So I'm just going to say unhealthy organizations. What are the features of an unhealthy organization? And yeah. one feature of an unhealthy organization is when spouse, you know, spouses or parent child relationships where people can't tell each other what's going on. That's a red flag. If you're in an organization that makes you feel like you can't tell your partner or your parents or your children what's going on, there is something terribly wrong. Okay. But, but if we go one level deeper on that, you don't want to tell your parents because you don't want them to feel like they're failures, but also you don't want to tell them because you have what I call the Nephi complex. You love being Nephi, yeah. your ego, your sense of self, your ego, your pride, your identity is all wrapped up in being the noble Nephi child. And all of a sudden telling your parents means they're going to no longer see you as that golden child. And you're going to just fall from grace in their yeah. eyes. And I don't mean to project that onto you. No, but that's absolutely, um, absolutely the case. Um, so yeah. And, and I, you think, lose their love basically. Yeah. And so for me, I was fine just being like, I'll just keep this to myself. This will be my <laughs> thing. Maybe it'll come out over time. Um, but one thing I will say going through this and we've painted a picture of a pretty dreary first year of marriage. I would say at some point it transitioned into us throwing all expectations out the window and just seeing each other for who we are to broken people who deserve to be loved and understood and who are dealing with things and struggling with things. And, and there was, and it's just looking back over time. Um, 
this beautiful, like, I don't know, respect and love for each other has blossomed from such a terrible faith transition. And more and more, I'm seeing myself looking at Chelsea like, wow, like she, she just deserves to be able to, like, this is, as, as much as this is my secret, this is her dirty secret that she's having to keep in the closet and hide from everyone. And like, and so more, I think you wanted to be more open and be able to talk about it much more than just I did. Just to find like one or two friends or somebody that I could talk to because it just is so isolating and, um, it's yeah, too much to carry and it's so much quiet. to carry. And then to be around next family where everything, like every conversation, is re- relating somehow like back to the church. And I'm like, this just feels wrong, dishonest, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it like does. You're lighting, lying, yeah, we're being inauthentic. And um, anyway, so you had a conversation with. Your mom. Yeah, I was home one night, um, and somehow, I don't know, something came up. Uh, I don't oh, remember. Oh, it was Chad. Um, Wasn't it Chad? Uh, LGBT. Uh, I had a roommate who ended up, uh, we were uh, friends in high school, and I think it was Chad. Um, yeah, he ended up uh, coming out as gay, and at the time, I'm full BYU, I was like, why would you choose that? You know? And then over time realized like, Oh my gosh, how beautiful. And he ended up marrying someone and they're so happy. And, um, and so I think something was expressed about LGBTQ and I was like, eh, I just don't know if I think that. And, and I know my mom was like, well, wait, what are you saying? You don't think this, or you don't think that the prophet said, and, and you were testing the water. Yeah. And it just, I had no intention of coming out like this, but over the course of 15 minutes, it's my mom, myself and, and my younger brother. It just turned into like, well, do you think this like, uh, no. And then pretty soon she's crying and it just turned into a really ugly, sad. I mean, we're, it wasn't ugly like yelling at each other, but just a really sad. The falling sad from grace, like what you talked about. When she realized basically you communicated what to her. That that yeah, it, it culminated kind of these tiny baby questions of do you well this? How about that? Led culminated to, in I don't. I'm not a believing member of the church. You came out, and I'm trying to yeah. So um, and it wasn't. I just didn't anticipate it happening then. And she broke down sobbing. So yeah, she broke down and, uh, yeah, the next, so I, you know, the memory of that night is fading, but it was just, it was sad and my dad wasn't there, but, um, instantly it was, well, uh, I think I left and, and my dad texted me and said, it sounds like you had a conversation with mom. Would you mind coming back tonight and we can talk to more? So the next night I was up there and to my surprise, um, I know it was really hard for my mom and, and I think she shifted into defensive mode. Um, talking to my dad, he was very open and like, Oh, well, you know, tell me about the thing. Like, tell me about, like, I want to know the information that you're struggling with. I'd like to look into that too and see Uh if I can find Mm -hmm. answers. And so then, you know, I'm dropping stuff like, well, like, you know, I'm not just blindly following this document, but like, if you want a good overview, like CES letter, you could, you could poke through that. And so then my parents are both like, well, we got to read the CES letter and find all the answers. And then they read that and instantly shift into like, Nick is full blown deceived. This is like anti morphin propaganda. And he read this and just believed everything and he's gone. And so, uh, there was just, there was a lot of back and forth and, and then, and to their credit, especially my dad, he spent a lot of time looking into all of these things and trying to find, did um, he send you fair Mormon stuff? Yeah, I actually, and uh, man, my memory is not doing great today, but I actually, he set up a meeting with one of the former, um, leaders of, of fair Mormon. Um, and we spent a night talking about, um, you know, well, why is this an issue and why is that in, in, and, uh, you know, everything, I was just like, ah, this just feels very apologist. And like, Do you remember what types of issues you discussed? Yeah, like, well, Joseph, the, the failing bank. Um, Kirtland makes scandal. Yeah, yeah. And, and, well, when we look at these things, it actually turns out that Joseph did everything right. And there were, you know, elements beyond his control that actually, um, you know, and so. Caused people to lose their life savings. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, I. From my standpoint, I think I went in expecting that, like, never come home again 
or at least until you've figured this out, we need some distance. And that distance looks like probably five years distance. So just like, I went in expecting that. To be cut off. Like yeah. his expectations were so low that he was like, I didn't die. Yeah, like, and like, great. they still love me. <laughs> uh, and so it, overall, I realized it was absolutely so devastating for Let them. Let me just ask, did Fair Mormon help? Uh, you, you. No, no. I, I was at a it, point. Did it help in your relationship with you and your parents? Mm, no. Why? No. It, it was clear. I guess the. Why did it help you? Why did it help your relationship with your parents? Mm, it didn't help me because I, I felt like I had been very thoughtful in searching out source material around all these issues that I'm dealing with. And if someone comes back and cherry picks, just like, oh, well, you know, like that actually was a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a faith promoting thing. If you look at it this way and like, maybe if there's just one issue and you have to, you know, revise how you look at it, I'm like, okay, maybe. But if there's a hundred issues and every single one of them, you have to do a mental, you know, gymnastics backflip to be like, well, if you kind of twist it, it works. At the end, I'm like, no, you were you were trying way too hard, and and you were looking at this first with the conclusion that the church is true, and then how can I make this make it look like the church is true? And that was very clear to me that that like, no, if I just if I look at all these things and they're all kind of ugly, and then they all pile up together to be this ugly mess, it's a pretty good chance that, that under all of that is the the foundation is an ugly mess as well. Um, but I know addressing how did it affect uh, my relationship with my parents, I think they're looking at these things and being like, well, Nick, the answers are so simple. All of these things that you're having problem with, Fair Mormon just did a write-up. You can just like check, 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 check. They're all not problems anymore. Why aren't you Why aren't you being faithful in how you're looking at this? Mm -hmm, yeah. And the idea of I should be faithful um, or I should have like Sherry Dew's book, It's Worth the Struggle, it's all about, oh, sure, you can wrestle with doubts and problems, but you have to go to it with the predetermined conclusion that it's all true. And then how do you look at that and make it be true? And um, if anything, I think in life, I am uh, I would like to always be someone who looks at information and then says like, oh, that's not what I thought. I will pivot and I will change what I believe because like, rather than fighting against facts and science. Um, big believer in science here. And so, yeah, it just didn't feel like the, the responses to these questions um, were anti-science, not it just bent. How can I bend this to maybe look okay? Um, but from my parents' standpoint, it looked like, oh, Nick has thrown out the spirit and faith as legitimate um, resources when trying to make a decision. And for them, uh, which those things are legitimate uh, reasons or, or, uh, uh, things that they can fall back for making a decision. It just made me look even worse that that I'm I'm choosing not to look at the faithful answer and I'm choosing to push all that side and I'm trying to believe the worst possible thing about the church. And so apologetics definitely did myself and and them, I think, a disservice um going through all this. All right, Chelsea, what 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 are what's coming through your mind and how's the story working for you? Uh, in parallel. Oh, with Nick's family. Oh, yeah. um, so I wasn't there for any of those conversations with Nick and his parents. Um, Were you relieved that he talked to him at least? I was. I oh, yeah, I that, was really. Yeah, um, I I just felt like this. It was time. Like we had done this enough, long enough, silently. Um, and I actually had my own few conversations with his parents. Um, it's interesting because I was obviously more in the same boat that they were, kind of like caught off guard by Nick's deconstruction of his faith. And um, anyway, but they were very, they were um, approached me like apologetic for their son. Like they knew that I had issues with dating and like wanting to, you know, have a great marriage. And so they were very kind. Um, but I mean, they offered, like they said, if you divorce our son, like we would support that, which I know um, it was very thoughtful. Like it was coming from a thoughtful place, but uh, I came home and told Nick and that was just devastating because for him, he was l perceiving my only value to you is in the church and I'm still your son. I'm still a good person, but because I no longer believe like I am not worth it. You know, what did you think about that statement? I was really hurt too. Cause I'm like, divorce was already on my mind. And so to hear somebody like an outside party say that, 
like that was really troubling because I'm like, oh, so you're perceiving how bad it is. Like it was just weird to hear somebody else suggest it. it caught me off guard for sure. And um, it and I look at now and I just I feel angry about it. But I know like they were grieving and it was literally like perceived as a death for them and their family, like to think about eternity and. And like, so they were definitely grieving. Uh, and a no brainer in my parents' marriage, the church being what holds them together. If, if one of them left the church, it'd be like, yeah, divorce is pretty much on the table and solidified. So yeah. I, I could see how they would project that to us. Um, and and what's like, the Mormon teaching of family that makes that reaction? Oh, just that the your stakes. salvation, uh, and especially a woman is, like is tied, tied to, to the man. Or, and you're tied together. And yeah, if, if I'm not going... Like, I know John said, if you need a blessing, like he kind of stepped into that role that Nick was supposed to fill of being a priesthood leader in our home, that he was like, I will I will do that. Nick's dad. Nick's dad yeah, did yeah. that. But, but finish it out. If, but, if, but it means, yeah, if, if I'm not going down this path and, and going to end up in the celestial kingdom, you're not going to end up there no. unless you attach yourself to another man who's going there, <laughs> which is so... <laughs> Yeah, backwards. it was. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we've had with Nick's family, like he didn't tell his siblings for a while. Um, yeah. And uh, he ended up sending an email and it was kind of met with. I'll let you say it. I don't know. I, I, I'm sure it was just a painful shock. And so, um, you know, there's a, I, I ended up saying, I'm like, I'm not going to call everyone together and be like, I'm going to tell you some really devastating news and make you react in the moment. At least for my family, it felt better. Like I'll send an email, then they can all like think about it, react, reflect, and maybe we'll have a follow-up conversation within a week or so. And, and, uh, I don't know. I, I received some positive responses. Did you send like, an email to everyone? Yeah. Did you list all the reasons why or? No, no. I really tried to be. Absolutely not. It was I the most sugar-coated the email. Yeah. Just like, Hey, like it was. Yeah. I, um, my brother-in-law responded and is like, oh, that's okay. Like, I have questions too. You framed it as I have some questions. Yeah, and then, he and then someone else sure. got explained to him like, no, Nick's saying he's out because of those questions. And then it was like, oh, oh, I didn't, oh, shoot. So I definitely was very sugarcoaty and apologetic. And then anyone. when everyone realized the magnitude, it was. Yeah. It was what? Well, I don't know. I, a, a lot of uh, silence. It, it, it didn't turn into combative explosions and all. It, it's just kind of, and there have been um, acknowledgments that like, hey, I think that what you're doing, is, that you're trying to be good and you're seeking truth. And that seems like, and I, for me, I'm like, yes, like that is as good of a, a response as I could hope for. But I know it has been absolutely just the last thing that they would hope for me and, and devastating. Um, yeah. And I, I perceived the silence as Nick was like overjoyed that he wasn't completely cut out of his family. But I was like, I, I felt devastated because I also was looking for support, you know, and cause I was like, I don't know if this marriage is going to last. And that's, I call it the crickets effect. That is the most common response from parents, from siblings, from ward members. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like the faith crisis is viewed as a virus. It's like yes. a quarantine. You, you need to quarantine it. And the way you quarantine the faith crisis is, is, a, is, is separation. You, yeah. you don't talk about it. You avoid it and you just pretend it's not there or you risk infecting yourself right, and right. other people. So we're not blaming Nick's parents, we're not making them out to be bad people. That is the most common response. And it's incredibly hurtful and disappointing and uh, traumatic uh, uh, for, for the people that are on the receiving end of the silence. That's yeah. a really great way to put it. Yeah. And, it's a and, virus. But, and I can tell, I can see why it makes sense. It's it it's does. a very uncomfortable thing to deal with on both sides. So I just would like to like, if any of one of my in-laws or somebody came to me, and even if it was something I just could not comprehend, if they came to me in tears saying that they were struggling, you know, it just, it doesn't seem like a natural response, but I think that's just so much of the indoctrination and the, the fear of believing something outside of the church. Like there's, it's, it's hard yeah. to explain to someone who's not a member of the church or part of an Orthodox religion just how deep it goes, you know? Yeah. What response would you have liked? Just even an, an acknowledgement. Just even if they're like, hey, Nick is deceived. I don't even know what's going on. But like, I love you and I support you. And as, if there's something that we could do for you to show that better, like, please tell us. 
Yeah, and, and anything. Yeah. Honestly, just just acknowledging that we existed and that that it was hard. Like I'm sorry that this is hard for you. You know, just yeah. something. Yeah, and and what I was going to say earlier, in contrast to your family, like I know you talked to this earlier about uh, you know with your mom. Yeah, what about your mom? Yeah, I guess you can tell she her. She pulled me aside one day, like we, I was just in her car, and she said, um, I know Nick is a good man. Like she she recognized that, and he was, you know, very involved in my life. And um, anyway, she said, is this something that I should support? You know, she just put that out on the table. I said, yes, like Nick and I are wanting to make it work. And she's like, okay. Like mm-hmm. that, it was just a very, like she, yeah. She just got on board immediately and she's like, I, I want you to still believe in God. Like, I want you to still find value in the church. Like, that's where she hoped for me. But she's like, if you want to stay married to Nick, I know he's a good man. So she was supportive. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good response. Yeah. 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 I, I yeah. really appreciated her response. And my dad was the same. Like, um, they were divorced at the time or separated at least. And, and he was obviously very emotional and just like, I, the church means everything, you know, and and bore his testimony, but he still was like, I don't want to lose you. So I'm going to support you. So anyway, there was a contrast, but. And with all of your sisters as well, it, it, it was something we didn't feel like, you know, we've talked about this coming out with my family. It didn't even feel like there needed to be as much of a coming out on your side. Because yeah. I guess with you and especially Rich, who at the time were just like talking, we lived so close. Um, and kind of like what you said, like I told my mom everything, you know, and it just seemed like a natural thing. Like once Nick said, I feel comfortable with you talking about it with other people, that it was just a natural thing, you know. Yeah. So, but that has slowly shifted with me being more public about it. I mean, coming out and like disbelieving is one thing and then sharing about it a lot is another, so... You want, should we go to that next when, when you guys sure. started talking openly about that? Yeah, yeah, openly and then probably baby blessing time. Right? So, yeah, we had my daughter, Ellie, and I was still um, trying to make the church work uh, at the time. And so I wanted to bless her. And, and obviously Nick was at a place where he didn't believe in the priesthood or anything. So like that, we met with the bishop several times. And I mean, the bishop in the ward that we were in in Bountiful was great. Like he handled everything the best that he could have, you know? Yeah, I think our Orin Bishop would have said, like, yeah, bless, like, if your baby's going to be blessed, like, if you feel like you can do it, do it. We're bountiful. He was like, you know, honestly, if you don't believe in, in the priesthood, like, you probably which shouldn't I, do this. I, I agree, which, Yeah, which right? I was like, okay, that's probably So, valid. anyway, my dad did it in our home, but this had been months and months of agonizing and Nick feeling like this would be a shame-filled experience with him being pigeonholed as a terrible father publicly in front of both of our families together. Because I know as a kid growing up, you'd see people bless, and anytime I saw a grandparent bless a, a, a like, recently born child, like, I would be like, Dad has porn problems or like, like I would instantly know, like the guy's not, he's doing something wrong. Shame on you, dad. Um, and that's, you know, yeah, shameful for, the, for those who aren't Mormon, it's the Mormon dad blesses the babe, the Mormon baby into the, you know, gives them a name and a blessing into the church. It's a ritual like a baptism or a christening. And it's always supposed to be the dad that does it. Yeah. So yes. it's, it's, it's in the ward, it's at church, it's in front of everybody traditionally. And so if the dad doesn't do it, then everybody's saying, why? There what's must be sin? a reason. Is yeah. he cheating? Is he into porn? Is he an addict? Like, what's the problem? And so, and even if there's nothing wrong and you're just having doubts and questions, a leader can say, well, you're not worthy to yeah. bless your kid. So now Chelsea's dad has to do it or some member mm. of the ward. And it's almost like being cuckold. It's almost like being emasculated. Yep. Because Absolutely. You, you feel, like you're the first, shamed, like right? Like the first rite of passage for uh, Ellie I am not a, a good enough dad to do. And that really sucked. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. but, I mean, we compromised saying let's do it privately in our home. That way it won't be like this public shaming scarlet letter experience for Nick. And both of our families knew where Nick was, so it wasn't like yeah. a coming out. But, um, anyway, the day actually went better than we thought. Like, my dad gave a – he came over actually a few days before the blessing and asked what he, Nick and I would like to – to be said, yeah. which I really appreciated that yeah, gesture. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I thought that was really nice. So he gave a really respectful blessing. Like we said, maybe it'd be best not to like, I bless you to get married in the temple. And you know, like he kind of took all of that verbiage out and just made it more of like, 
and bless you with peace and you know good family and support yeah, yeah it really so good. it was nice and any the day ended up great but you know as with most LDS people are wanting to post about this beautiful day um, with your baby in the blessing dress. It just felt inauthentic to be like, hashtag blessed, our child is blessed. But with all the behind the scenes that had just been agonizing that I kind of came out as saying, oh, we're a mixed faith and my dad blessed her at her house. So this is on Instagram This post. is on Instagram. You an say Instagram what? post. Just basically like we're in a mixed faith uh, marriage and my, I didn't spell into all the details, but I basically just outed ourselves and just said my dad gave a really beautiful blessing like at our house. And Good. so I wasn't pretending to be anything, but like, here's my daughter and her blessing dress, you know, like. And did you have a decent following at the time? No, or? I mean, just like close family, friends, acquaintances at BYU. Um, and yeah. anyway, I was so nervous though. Cause most before that I was just sharing pictures of like my family, fun vacations we went on. And so I like was so nervous. I turned my phone off, uh, just like the vulnerability hangover. And, uh, then I turned my phone on like later that night and it was just like an outpouring of love and lots of messages of, um, support and quite a few friends who I had no idea were also in a mixed faith marriage or trying to figure out like if they should stay in the church or not. And, so it was just kind of a blessing of like, oh, wow, there's just so many of us. And I just had no idea. So by opening up, yeah, others, it could. like invited others to come and share some of their hardship. And, and I, it was a really positive experience. So Man, it's the gift of vulnerability. It is. It yeah. is. So, and that was the first time that we had shared anything. And then I didn't talk about it. Um, after that until a roommate who, or not a roommate, a friend who actually was living next door to us the time that we were setting boundaries and fighting a lot. <laughs> She works for the church and she worked in the marketing department and she said, the church is doing this program or trying to do this. I don't know. Just a new like social media initiative. Yes. And she's like, we've called eight or nine people to be guinea pigs to share a less traditional viewpoint on something an aspect so what of year the church. Would this have been? This was 2015. 2015, the beginning of 2015. So the church realizes that there are problems and they're, they're trying to. So they're trying to humanize a few little aspects. So she's like, I loved your baby blessing post and about mixed, your mixed faith marriage. What if you share something like that on uh, the church's Instagram? Yeah, you're correct. This is 2017. Cause this is Ellie's born. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. True. 2017. Sorry. Okay. So 2017, the church is realizing that social media is getting away from them. There's yeah. So many people November so many policy. Questions. Something. The November policy. Like the internet is like swamping the church with yeah. problems. And so they realize we need to, we need to get in front of that, have proactive social media campaigns that, that maybe help people feel more comfortable, that maybe address some tough issues. So it's a, it's an explicit PR church marketing initiative to reach out to social influencers and what? Um, and just share a snippet of your life that doesn't quite align with what you would see as a typical LDS family. Kind so the whitewashed, perfect, everything's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So there, she said there are eight or nine of us. I don't know who else. Um, like I didn't know anyone else who she called, but she said, okay, just write something. And you know, the church has a bunch of different like blogs and offshoots of, so I didn't know it was going to be the official church Instagram until like the day before. And, um, I started to get nervous because at that point, like, I mean, it was the scarlet letter for Nick's family to have like, I don't even think anyone in your ward fa home family or anybody no. knew anything yeah, about yeah. you. And so the fact that anyone who follows the church online would know that Nick's left the church. Like I know that was not something. So what his, was the post? So on the church official, Instagram. the church official Instagram, basically like Nick has left the church. <laughs> it's Did really a photo of you guys. Yes. A photo of both of us with our baby and her blessing dress, the three of us in yeah. a photo. And then your, your text of like, was the text your words? Yes. Yeah. So I you wrote saying, everything. Yeah. That we were in a mixed faith marriage and, uh, and, and it was more about how you can still make it work. Wasn't it lean in? Wasn't it like, yes, it was that, move in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Move in closer. T tell the, tell the basic sentiment. Uh, basically like, uh, if you're s struggling to have empathy with people, who leave the church, like move in or move in with people who have, who don't look like the traditional believing spouse. So I talked about like someone not being able to bless their baby, you know, and like just moving in closer to hear their stories. And when you find out more about them, it'll be harder to villainize and to think less of them. So basically it was like, let's stop judging people for not fitting the norm in the church.
And I guess if we're going to give credit where credit is due, that's pretty cool that oh, yeah. finally the church is oh, willing 100%, to, to yeah. be vulnerable and to talk about some hard things. Yeah. And they're using you guys to help tell the story. So they atta- I was the very first person that they were rolling out with this new social media program. And anyway, they tagged me for maybe 30 minutes. And it was like my friend texted me and she's like, we have to untag you because we're not trying to create like we're not trying to sponsor people. Cause then I just started getting, getting followers. Yeah, so followers. Like I think I got like five or 600 followers within 30 minutes. And she's like, how many like, followers did the church account have at the time? Any oh, oh, I, I have don't no know. idea. A okay. lot. Okay. Thousands yeah. and thousands and thousands. So you get like 500 followers. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe. Something like, and then it just started getting like, but people had tagged me in the comments cause they knew me. And so like slowly more and pe- more people just started reaching out to my private page and it just started rolling out. But they I think that was wise of them not to sponsor people because I think they would be very embarrassed of sponsoring me now at this point. Um, but that's weird because they want everyone to follow them and to yeah. tag them, but then they they may not want yeah. to promote and tag other people. Are you like, yeah, on time? Oh, no, I just... Okay, uh, just make it sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, there's a bit of a double standard there. They want the followers, but then they don't want to... Yeah. And they weren't getting any followers from me because I was just a small little account. But it was it was a um, the feedback was mixed, way more mixed than like our little blessing post was all positive Uh, because, I mean, the projections of Nick, like, how could you possibly want your husband to like be in the same house with your child? Your child's going to hell, like all of these weird things, you know, just. So Comments sure. or messages, direct messages, uh, direct messages of people who like disagreed with what I, you know, what I was saying. And that was, it was mostly positive, a little bit of negative, but then the church later said, uh, or the person, the woman I was working with to create that post, she messaged and said that post performed the second best to president Monson's passing. Like just no, in the, the stats expo- yeah. and it was, I don't think it was anything that I wrote. I think it was just that they were talking about something that wasn't pretty imperfect. And I think people were craving that and they saw that. And so they're still doing that on their Instagram now, but, um, just these stories just started rolling out, you know, of people who felt like they've been marginalized or don't align with some of the things about the church anyway. So they asked me to write a follow-up blog a few months later so this was 2018, like in June or July when it was published. It was Who Do I Choose, God or My Husband? Um, and this one, yeah, this one was very mixed response. Um, what did you basically say in the article? And this is on the church's LDS This org? is on the church, yeah, LDS. Well, do- once again, you thought it might be on like, oh, one of their blogs or something. And no it was idea. on like the f- homepage of LDS.org for like a couple days. And on it, the homepage? It was on the, it was like the front and center main hero image. It's like, who do I choose, God or my husband? Which I later read on a post-Mormon uh, Facebook group saying, what a clickbait title. And it is a clickbait title, but like. Yeah. It, Can I just say, I had been begging, I had talked to Elder Holland about this. I had been begging for the church for 15 years to help make some sort of statement to just say, don't abandon your spouse if they lose their faith. Yeah. Like I, this was an answer to my prayers, my secular prayers by that point, (laughs) because I had been for 15 plus years swimming in the divorces and the fractured families of all the people the church was just leaving high and dry. I, I I had two lunches with, with elder Holland and in the second mm-hmm. lunch, I'm like, can the church please just make a statement that says, don't leave your spouse. This is like 2009, 2010. Don't leave your spouse if they have a faith crisis because the church is destroying families. Yeah. And it, it wasn't until this that that it seemed like the church finally started getting the message, which, which I was sad that it took so long. I was outraged yeah. that yeah. it took so long. And I was so happy to see it happen. Yeah, because the narrative before, and that's even what I talked about in the article of the narrative is like you get divorced or like you leave your spouse, and that's an honorable thing to do. Um, and you know, bishops, bishops would tell couples that. Yeah, board members, parents. Yeah. So anyway, I I try to humanize Nick as best I possibly could, saying like you can do both. I can still stay in the church and still love and support my husband who. Who doesn't? So that was the essential meat of this the story, and uh, it was interesting going back and forth writing because I would use adjectives or describe Nick, and anything that was humanizing him would be removed from the article. So it definitely had quite a few drafts to get to the one that was published. They yeah. didn't want to. 
be you don't, too. Yeah, right. I didn't want to humanize. And, and they wanted the to make sure that it was Nick uh, leaving, and like that was his choice, and kind of him inflicting that on our family. Like it was, it was. Um, a weird experience. You weren't super happy about because I was the trying editing. so yeah. hard to make it work, and then this was just another pinpoint of like villainizing Nick, which is exactly what my article was trying to say not to do, you know. And so, I mean, the employees that I worked with at the church, they were wonderful and and doing their job. You know, I don't have faults with them, but just the whole process of writing for the church is really difficult because you have to follow the rules. Of, Those messages are super correlated. Yeah, yeah got, they've. They've got a message that they want to convey and a framing and you got to fit into their framing and their yeah. messaging. Yeah, and you definitely. have to like include like, there's like a scripture reference or they had a, a list of things that I needed to include in the blog post. So <laughs> yeah, it's really PR, you know? Oh, it definitely was super PR. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the response to that was like, I still have PTSD with posting on Facebook because it was so bad. Just people, I mean, no matter what, and now as I've stepped away from the church, I can see people's um, arguments with me, you know, like, why can't she see the light? Or, you know, so people were attacking me. They were also for attacking what? Nick. For what? Uh, for keeping stakes in the ground at the church. Like, just have the whole family leave. Like, just, you know, so like it. Ex-Mormons? So, yeah, there were people from that standpoint. But then also. Ex-Mormons were saying yeah. you should just leave. Yeah. Like, why are you trying to make something work that clearly will not work for your family? You're going to hurt your kids in the process. Um, Basically saying it's bad. It's bad that I'm trying to make it work. Okay, that's one attack. And then, like, for Nick, obviously the attacks of, like, how could he do this to your family? If he really loved you, he would stay. Like, the pain that he's inflicting. And then they would project where our kids are going to be in the future. And I got, like met like paragraphs like i got an email that made me so angry that I, what did it say she as someone who had left the church and she was attacking me like if only you knew and she was trying you know say all the things bad about the church or critical about the church and and stuff and i responded my first line was like i don't know if i should say this on the podcast but i'm like i know joseph smith was an asshole in a lot of ways and that like completely changed the trajectory of the conversation because like i was aware like nick and i had been talking for years at this point um, I knew that there were a lot of substantial issues, but I also was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to leave. Like I, I like it here still, like it still was working. And so we just got ripped apart. I mean, obviously there was also a lot of positive yeah, responsive. You remember the negatives, but yeah. what were the positives? The positive, a lot of, a lot of people are like, my spouse is questioning. I don't know what to do. Like, and I think it was just hopeful to see another message. Like it doesn't have to mean the end for your family when somebody questions and that they were so grateful that the church would, would push this narrative out that like you can make it work. So there was a lot of positives and like, I still get messages of like, Oh, you're the, who do I choose woman or whatever? Cause yeah, that article was it definitely seems so long ago, but uh, substantial for some people and how they were approaching their mixed faith marriage. So overall is the article something the Instagram and the blog post, is it something you guys, number one, are glad you did versus not glad? And is it something that was overall harmful to you or neutral or helpful? Like, as you reflect back, are you, are you glad you did it or not? I'm interested in your answer. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think for sure the pros outweighed the cons. And I think, if anything, it could have been a selfish thing that I was able to find friends and community that I needed. It helped you find yes, community? Yes, yeah, because people would come into my DMs or private message me and just say, I'd love to get lunch or I'd love to talk. Like, Anyway, there was just this camaraderie that I was craving for so long, and it was like, wow, there's so many of us. This is awesome. I mean, but there's also um, this idea of maybe don't share publicly until you've healed. And I was just an open wound as I was posting and the years to come as I was posting and deconstructing publicly. Um, and that has inflicted a lot of pain and, and probably some trauma, unnecessary trauma of, I didn't, I didn't know my voice, let alone unsolicited opinions on how I was navigating this journey, you know? But, but I think that's also <laughs> what's made so many people interested in, in following you it, yeah, seeing this process develop. Like if you like go into this ugly faith transition thing and then fall silent and then three years later pop up and be like, we figured it out. Like, who's that helping? Yeah, I so, don't know. It's, it was a personal decision and I just felt like to stay authentic because then I would get people messaging like, 
as my sh belief started to shift over the months and, and the la next two years, like people would be like, well, how do you make this mixed faith marriage work? If you're super believing and he's doesn't believe in God, like I would, I'd, I'd have to say, well, I'm less, we're less and less mixed at this point. And so I just felt like I had to just for the authenticity sake to keep posting and updating, like, oh, yeah. actually I'm struggling with this and this is kind of hard. And it's true because a lot of people anchored onto you yeah. like Chelsea's is making it work. Her husband left, but she is making it work. If I, I just need to figure out what her secret is. And there's so many people messaging you. But that. we do that to uh, lots of people. Like you'll see a friend and be like, they're doing it so I can do that. And if it that they change their status, it, you know, it rocks you. Yeah. That's the thing. Because if, if any Mormon out there discovers that their child or, or in-law daughter or son-in-law is having faith, they use your story to say, look, she can still yeah. stay. You should yep, absolutely. put pressure on the believing. You, If Chelsea can stay, you can stay and and keep the mixed faith marriage is good and keep yeah. it. And it, it can be used as a, as a weapon yeah. to pressure people. Like I think of Josh Weed, right. And like Tom Christopherson, Lolly. like there's just like people that you just like, you really stake a lot of weight into their stances and it can be really hurtful. So. Yeah. And I had this conversation with Alan and Katie Mount because yes. when they first started Marriage on a Tightrope, you know, I think, I think, uh, I'm not trying to tell anyone's story, but I think, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, well, Alan's a non-believer now and Katie is a believer now. And I think they, they had a question for me at one point, which is like, is this sustainable? Because the truth is it, a, a believing spouse tends to become non-believing at some point for a couple reasons. One is because they have to go, they go through their own process. The information they've been, they've been exposed to the virus. Yeah. So they're going to catch the virus at some point, probably most likely, not always, but most likely, but also the church isn't set up to make mixed faith families feel good. Like it doesn't feel good to go to church and to have your spouse not go with you. It doesn't feel good every time they talk about eternal families for you to be thinking when you're at church, well, that doesn't count. That's not my story because my husband's no longer believing. And then you get to see all these ha supposedly happy families who are faithful. And it church becomes this constant reminder that you're not unplanned, that you failed, that your family's not going to be exalted. And so it's really hard, I think, for the believing spouse totally. to hang on. Yeah. And so over time, you've been held up as these icons or these examples of mixed faith, of a mixed faith couple but is it sustainable? And then you're faced with disappointing everybody who's yeah. looking yeah. up to you as a role model. And it's not just a handful. It's like hundreds or maybe even thousands. And so it's it's really hard to be thrust into the public spotlight. Yeah, I yeah, I really like I what think. you said. No, and, and it is weird because you make these assumptions like, and people would tell me and project like, oh, it's only a matter of time before you leave. And I would hate that and I would resist. And I think that was maybe also subconsciously another reason I wanted to stay was to prove people wrong that like, no, I can change the narrative. I can stay. Um, but, and I want to say like, oh, I, I made all this up on my own, like this decision. But like Nick definitely had an influence and I would be naive to say that he didn't. Um, you know, what you were talking about of like the church isn't equipped to or making, you know, mixed faith marriages feel good at church is like I went to the temple and then, you know, through an endowment session. And this was at a time before they changed some of the verbiage, but I was realizing that I was like covenanting through my then atheist spouse. And I'm like, what is going on? This hurts like daggers. I don't want to be here. You know, there were enough like points that, um, you know, a big one, um, a hard part for me was, uh, the priesthood, you know, we had another child after Ellie, and I actually wanted to bless him because I'm like seeing how like hard it was for Nick uh, and just meeting with bishops. And I'm like, I, f I feel mad that I have to outsource to my dad. Like I am so involved in these kids' lives. Why can't like, I'm fully capable of doing it, you know? And so that desire grew even more knowing that Nick was like tapped out of that role. And Nick tapping out actually, like people would tell me, oh, um, Nick could have been so great. It was all about this lost potential. Like I had people coming up to me all the time. Like he was, he could have been a powerhouse, you know, and I would, I would be so angry and sad. And I think partly because I felt those things too, you know, I had my patriarchal blessing. I had put him in that role of like, he was going to be such an amazing dad and priesthood leader in the church. Um, but I think I was also partly sad because I'm like, I don't think anybody would ever say that about me. Like if I left, 
you know, and realizing how much Nick had and then lost, like we were at the same level and I was realizing how much I didn't have because Nick had tapped out of his potential priesthood. And I realized like, I, like, I want the priesthood. Like, why are we at the same status when I am trying so hard to make this work? And we show up and we're like equals, we're peers in the leadership power play of the church, you know, and that was a huge, huge thing for me. Yeah, that was that really I could big. have been a mission president. You could have been the wife of a mission president. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not trying to downplay like that. There are very influential women in the church and I know that. Um, but like just seeing it and play out in our lives and in our family dynamic and the church, like I, the patriarchy really like that really rocks me. And I wouldn't have really exposed myself to that if he didn't leave. So I feel like there's all these experiences that I just could not have, um, projected would happen but seeing nick leave like that really changed my role and my relationship with the church because it made you feel less it made it shown a spotlight on the fact that your status was lesser i want to make sure i understand like my proximity to priesthood which is the power and the currency in which you can have important be the person in the room where the decisions are happening was removed like nick cut that and so i my proximity to that power that the, like, I wish it was more than the priesthood power. Like if we had currency outside of male and women roles in the church, like that would totally alleviate that burden. But right now at the priesthood line is a huge, um, connection to, I don't know, being in the room where important things are, are said and talked about and decisions are made and, and Nick cut that. And I didn't realize the ramifications that that would have on my role oh, and so my if, worship. So if, if the church is run by the skeleton of patriarchy with right. men having access to power and prestige and influence and status and decision-making, and then Nick gets cut off, then, then you're cut off as well. Yeah. Like our for, family, for nothing that you did of your right, own. Right. Right. And so anyway, it, it sounds selfish to say that, um, or conceded like I'm just out for power, but I I think that just goes for anybody. Like I just want, I want to, to walk into a chapel and see women on the stand. Like I'm just realizing how many things that I thought were neutral were not neutral. It's not neutral to get you know worthiness interviews. It's not neutral to see general conference and and vast majority of them be men, you know, male leaders. Like that's not neutral. And I started to be more aware and mindful of that. And it just got so heavy. And then with Nick cutting that cord, I was just like, and me wanting to bless our baby. And it just felt, I don't know. But what? All of those times that I had suppressed, like it's not that bad, like in ward council, um, you know, there were some hurtful things that were done. And I felt like if only I had the priesthood, then maybe they would trust me more or put me in charge of something more like I could. Or your feedback would be considered more. Heavily. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Something. I would have more weight to my existence in the church. Um, and Nick's uh, leaving made that more tangible. And I, I just kept saying, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's not that. And then having stepped away, like there aren't those comments, like the comments are, what about your kids? Like, what about your children? And then again, it's like, it's my only power in the church, the line of the family tree. Am I just supposed to extend the family tree? Is that what my role was in the church? And it just felt like a slap in the face that I would, I felt like all those times I wish that it wasn't true. And it's feeling like it is. So that, that basically, again, it's not about concern for you. It's about what about your children? Yeah, like again, you're that, that your message children. about your body is sex is for children. Your body's for children. Your worth yeah. is your children. And you know, what about you Yeah, as an individual? Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't know. And I feel like leaving, I get, I know people are like, well, you can make the church a better, safer place. And I, I do still feel like, oh man, that would have been awesome to do that. But I don't want to expose Ellie and Will. Like that was the catalyst for me stepping away. I heard this quote from Glennon Doyle about the God memos we get as kids are carved in our hearts and their heart is held to buff out. And I'm like, I don't want to bring my kids to Say a chapel. Again. Say that again. The God memos we get as kids are carved into our hearts and their heart is held to buff out. And hearing that quote, like that for me was like, I don't want to expose Ellie to the patriarchy that walking into that chapel of just sitting there 
you know, and just seeing all of them and just the visibility of the patriarchy is so huge. Like, just look at the pictures of all the general authority leaders and like, it's undeniable. It's undeniable. And so that's for me, I was like, I just don't want to expose my kids to that. So that was the yeah. final, like after going to church, you know, by myself or Nick would sometimes come and hang out with nursery with the kids. You know, we did that for a while and I just said, but at what cost? Like why, you know, and belonging and community, we were the big things. And so that's when I was like, maybe I'll just post about meeting up with people who can relate. And that's when the Facebook group and the community started to grow. What did you do? So one night I just hopped on Instagram and just said, hey, does anyone want to come over to our house and have a pizza party and game night? And we can talk about our existential crises together. <laughs> and 20 ladies, like strangers showed up. And I was surprised that... I mean, this is kind of a weird thing to just invite someone to. And anyway, so the ladies came over and they stayed until like midnight or one. Well, it was kind of like random conversations and whatever. And then everyone went downstairs in a circle. And yeah. then like everyone just went through their heavy stories. And it's just like there were a lot of the same themes, but everyone was unique in their stories. And, and, and what was that like for you? Uh, it was just so validating. Like it was just so, and we all weren't at the same belief status. Like some people were still trying to make it work. Some people had stepped away and just the wisdom and everyone was so thoughtful and mindful, like with the way that they would describe their journeys to be respectful. But we decided to just start a Facebook group with just those 20 ladies. And then um, we started to do meetups and this was before COVID. Like we had Thomas Wortham and Conkey come to our house. We cleared out all of the furniture in our house. Every single, we put it on the back porch and we. I had, got, I got down in the crawl space and reinforced the joists in our <laughs> floor so that we could have house. more people. And, yeah. And it's not a big house. And we fit like a hundred people in there. We just put chair to chair bodies. People are sitting up our staircase, like in our kitchen, um, in the hallway. And Thomas led us through like a beautiful meditation and then talked about the stages, you know, navigating. Just recreating crisis. my experience with it. Yeah. Nick's Copy like, can paste. you rec recate that? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, sure. You know, and we had Janice Spangler. She did, um, a meetup of just answering questions of people trying to figure out and how to make it work and questions about how to deal with family. And we had like a sex therapist one time we did like white elephant. Like we were just doing meetups at the park. Um, was the intent to help people stay in a mixed fifth marriage to help people stay in the no, church? What was the, I intent? mean, and it, like when I started the group, I was still trying to make the church work, uh, for our family. But as it evolved, like, I mean, it's just, you can't, it's hard to stay put in one spot. And so I think we all just have unraveled. Um, now the faith, no, 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 the faith journey meetups is what the group is called on faith Facebook. Faith journey meetups. Faith journey meetups. Is it public or? It's private, private because there are quite a few, it's women only at this point. Cause initially it started as mixed faith support. And I just thought it could get kind of hairy if we had uh, male men and women spouses meeting up together in what is probably a tense situation at home, you know? So I just wanted Holy. to avoid the drama. So at this point it was uh, ladies only and- Mostly Salt Lake? Um, yeah, but it has just started to grow. And so now it's about 2000 women. What? Yeah, and it just seriously, maybe like 25 ladies join it every week. Just it's constantly growing. I don't know. And and they're all bearing their soul and saying like, this is the thing keeping me alive. This is like where I'm finding. A lot of people are closeted as they're transitioning away. So it's more of women who have left the church or who are navigating slash transitioning or distancing and setting boundaries. How does someone join if they want to join? Just request to join and I will add you. Can they see it? Uh, they can search it. It, so it comes right up. Group. It's a it, yeah. it comes up, but yes, but yes, you have to uh, yeah. It initially started as private, but then so many women started joining. I'm like, I can't just go manually do this because I was just doing it by myself. And so, yeah, they just search it, and then um, I'll. And the accept. types of people you want are people in faith crisis, women, women, women in faith who crisis. are in need of support. Whether and there's some women who are still trying to make some aspects of the church work, but um, it's not a group if you to join if you haven't explored some of the critical things about the church. So um, anyway, I would say a vast majority have left, but it has been very, uh, for a Facebook group dealing with something as difficult and complex as a faith transition. We've had maybe five instances where I've had to like resolve some issues, but it has been very supportive and empathetic. And I think the women are just like craving to talk about what's hard in their lives.
And and if it is mostly women who at this point have left, I think most of them have been in that group through some phase of their transition. Yeah, there are a few ladies that we started out as mixed faith and we've all kind of transitioned away together just on our own journeys. But yeah. How common is it for a woman to go into faith crisis mode and then uh, resolve it and then stay faithful versus end up leaving and lo losing faith? I've seen one woman in the group who's of, done that out of the 2000. <laughs> I, it, I think it's very, Those very rare. Numbers. That was a perplexing case. <laughs> but um, I don't, I, I mean, maybe there are some others that haven't told me. There have been like one or two that have messaged me and said, I, this is kind of a hard place that I'm really trying to like stay as faithful as possible. And I think if you're really trying to stay as faithful as possible, um, and you, it may not be the best group to join unless you need support in doing that. But the women have all just been very, like some of my best friends now I, I met in the group. And so. Did COVID kind of kill the momentum? Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. What were you doing in terms of meetings before COVID? So yeah, we did the Thomas Worth and McConkey, the Janice Spangler. We did some play dates, and it's also like a, meant to be a hub that other women can meet and just do their own play dates. So there's just a bunch of like offshoots of women, and even now there are women who are like, can we, let's go on a hike together, and there's like five women who go, you know. So it's just kind of a hub to be like, is anybody in St. George? And this has branched to people out of state as well, but mostly Utah. But yeah, it's just like, is anyone located here? I'd love to chat with somebody. And I just had a friend call um, on the phone. She's someone I met in the group. And she said, this group has literally been life-changing. I just met a friend in the group and we talk often. And, you know, so it's just like when you step away from the ward, you're kind of stepping away from a very convenient way to meet with other people. And so this was just similar to Thrive. This is just another way to do that. It's a little bit more work. but Sounds like a full-time job. It is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, is. it is. It's so fulfilling yeah. for me. It's so, I just, yeah, I love it. The community. I just can't wait till we can start doing meetups again. What do you want to do? So what, what do you see the future of the group potentially being? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. Right before, right as COVID kind of shut everything down, we had a, it's scheduled at Lindsay Hansen Park to talk about your polygamy because that is such a huge topic. And her podcast comes up every few days on the group forum, you know. Um, and so I, I would love to create just, I don't know, more meetups and a, a venue for people who are wanting to raise kids around other people who are like minded, similar to what the ward aspect brings. You might have to drive a little bit further, but if we could create a place that's you know, great for families to come together and couples and ways to meet friends who you feel like you won't be judged for drinking coffee or not wearing garments or not believing in God. So, yeah. but I don't know. It's just it's, kind of unraveling. Yeah, it's open-ended. See what it becomes. Should the church be worried that groups like this pop up? So there's another group we've referenced, WACA or Women of a Certain Age, W-O-C-A, that's got thousands of women in it. And they're they're kind of more women 40 and above who are supporting each other, losing their faith, and then celebrating life after mm -hmm. Mormonism. So this sounds like a waka for 20 something. Yeah, yeah. Basically. It's a younger... Although waka has younger women too. But do you, should the church be worried that social media makes it so accessible for people to find community, to find support? Is it something that's all good? Is, is it from the church's perspective, is, is it dangerous? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, do you care? I, <laughs> well, I'm kind of, I'm going between the balance of burn it all down, but like with speaking of the church, but also like everyone close to us and family are all still very believing. And I want my kids and we want to have really good relationships with those people. So I'm trying to find that balance of like being respectful and honoring that, but also like, I'm so angry. And the fact that all these support groups are needed is just really unfortunate, but I think it's absolutely, uh, a detriment to the church for sure. Why? Like women, women join the group and are exposed to things. And even just in conversations, like the same way with Nick, like I was exposed to things that Nick was talking about that I don't think I would have naturally looked into myself. But then as I look into it, I'm interested and it's also devastating. So, I mean, you're just proximity to people, uh, with, uh, critical thinking of the church it's is, basically a is super, not a good thing. I, I hate to keep using this metaphor, but it's basically a super spreader. Group, groups like this <laughs> oh, become yeah. super spreaders of the virus. Well, and, and it's right? just, yeah, like 
especially me growing up, hearing about the good ship Zion and everyone who gets off, the, like they're drowned. They're miles back, clinging to an iceberg. It's going to melt and they're done. And so just being exposed to people I feel people like we're just like the little rowboat that just comes by and just like picks people who are swimming in the ocean and just plops them in. So it's not a place to get people to leave. That is definitely not the intention. The intention is to support where pe most people feel like they're doing it by themselves. And yeah, and then they see a bunch of other people in rowboats who are all singing songs and being happy. And it's like, wow, like it, the, it is not bad when you leave the good ship's eye. And like there's yeah, plenty there's beauty, of other. Yeah, like there are women who are you know like talking about their coffee orders or celebrating their double piercings or a new dress that they bought that they can't Showing show anybody tattoos, else and their tattoos yeah it's just trying like, alcohol for the first time yeah it's like a page of celebration and also women coming to terms with maybe feeling oppressed or you know things that are just really hard to work through and it's just like if you need some cheerleaders just you know 50 comments of women saying i believe in you i support you i think what you're doing is important because a lot of times many of these families and women are just feeling like being told that you're deceived. This is evil. You're bad yeah. for exploring, you know? So if you had to aggregate sort of a, a high, and this is putting you on the spot a bit. If you had to aggregate a high level summary of the ways that common ways, the church seems to be hurting women. What are some of the main sources of hurt that you're seeing repeat? Representation is huge. What do you mean? Uh, women leaders putting more women in places of privilege and position to make changes and to do art and to write in the, like the programs. I feel like just representation in the media and the things, the articles that the church produces would help alleviate some of that. So women are being hurt by not having representation. By not having, yeah. I okay. feel like... Um, yeah, I mean, garments in general, like that has been a conversation that has, and a topic that has unraveled and changes have been made, but I wonder like- How does that hurt, how have garments hurt women? Um, I mean, there's the physical and hygiene level of where it's complicated for women, where it isn't quite as complicated for men. And I wonder if more like women- infection. Yeah, we're involved in the process of making it and picking up materials. And, and I think there probably are now more so in the design of it. I think that- Uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but isn't it about body and sexuality and body love? Isn't there something around garments? And yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, and I feel like um, there are people like Dr. Julie Hanks, you know, on Instagram who are trying to break down some of those stigmas and the negative associations. And um, I would love to see it if garments were just optional. Like it just seems like it's, it's disappointing that it's um, like to get into the temple, you need to be wearing garments. That's like the repercussions of not wearing garments are huge. Um, yeah, are eternal. Yeah. Okay. How else are women being hurt? Um, uh, conversations around chastity and modesty, I think, are huge. And I think those are conversations that I'm seeing that are being changed and that are evolving, and um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, also work outside of the home and the whole stay at home mom and gender roles and the proclamation of the family, the proclamation of the family was also something that was huge in my town or my patriarchal blessing. It referenced it like three or four times. And that's a document that I read and studied at night going to sleep. And now I look at it and it's just like, so there's just, what's wrong with the proclamation? It's just so problematic Why? on the gender roles, the fixed gender roles, like women are feeling I have so many friends who are feeling like I need something outside of motherhood. I need something that's fulfilling, but I would be um, disappointing that expectation that the most important job and work you can do is raising your kids. So that's definitely a conversation that I feel like could really um, change in the topic of education. And um, what about that? Going to school to go to school and not as a venue to um, create an eternal family. Yeah. To meet a guy. Yeah. To, to be a good mom. Yeah. Study at elementary ed so that you can be yeah. a good mom. And I'm seeing these pushes from the inside from members, like women, and I think that's really important. So hopefully these conversations, um, I don't know, start to help. But it's it's hard because it seems like it's just pushing from the bottom up. So I would love to see more women involved. And in Yeah. And a lot of the women in your group, it sounds like the main pain is that they're going through this or their husband's going through this and they have no one to talk to. Right. And, and, and they'll say, this is the only place that I've posted publicly about this. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just creates a venue for their like 
otherwise complete silence in the rest of their lives. Yeah, and it's an interesting dynamic to see. Obviously, Nick left before me, and so I didn't get the opposite, where when the woman is the one who steps away before the husband, or maybe the husband won't, like there is a power dynamic that wasn't apparent in our relationship with the priesthood and um, being a leader in the home. And um, I know many women feel very dismissed um, by stepping away and trying to reclaim power or, you know, things that they feel like they're missing. Reclaim, claim. Or claim, yes. <laughs> claim, that's true. So, um, and they feel very dismissed and like, yeah, that they aren't being heard and that their needs aren't valid. Because Nick leaving and stepping away, like, I feel like, and especially because he made more money than I do um, or did at the time. And so I know that was something that I felt like him stepping away was a bigger hurt for the church than for me you know, to step away, but creating these Facebook groups. I mean, th this is definitely something that is not helping the church either. Um, yeah. one of the, sometimes when the critics like fair Mormon people want to attack me or Jeremy Runnels, you know, there will be people who, when the faith crisis happens, their marriage doesn't survive either because it was a really bad marriage to begin with, or they don't get the support from the in-laws or the parents that they should, or there's just too much stuff or, for whatever reason, there will be marriages that don't survive this. And uh, and so when a critic wants to kind of like, you know, attack me or Jeremy or others, Lindsay, they'll they'll say, well, you're breaking up families. Because mm -hmm. as soon as someone listened to Mormon stories, then later, fast forward, they got divorced, right? If I, I'm sure that many of the women in your group experience marital stress as they're going through all this and as they learn this stuff and as they even meet other women and talk about all the hard things. And I'm sure that's uh, led to some marriages being threatened. If somebody were to say, well, this group's bad for families, it's bad for marriages because all these women get there, complain about men, complain about the church, get all angry. And then, and then inevitably there's going to be some marriages break up. If somebody were to say to you, well, look, See, you're causing people to get divorced and you're breaking up families. What, what would you say about that? To that type of accusation? <laughs> yeah, that's quite the accusation. I mean, I feel like those marriages, um, in my experience, um, this is maybe anecdotal, but uh, the marriages that withstand a faith transition, um, I guess I don't want to make blanket statements, I'm just saying there are other factors that are in play, yeah. right? And and this might be a this might be just like the church and leaving the church. This is an opportunity to realize maybe we aren't compatible, or maybe the qualities of um, like for women who are married to men who love to use the priesthood over them, there are qualities that are underlying the priesthood uh, label. Like there are qualities to the personality that are problematic to the marriage and the leaving the church or joining the church or whatever is just exposing that. And so I feel like this maybe is a catalyst and sure that that can be an accusation that can be made, but I don't think that this is a reason that is breaking up families. I think there are other underlying factors that should also be considered. Well, and if the church was the only thing holding your marriage together and then and then that yeah. glue falls yeah. apart, whose fault is it? Well, it's probably more the church that is the only reason you got together in the first place. So, yeah. yeah. I like to say a faith crisis reveals your marriage. Yes, It yeah. doesn't ruin your marriage. It reveals your marriage. And if your marriage has strong fundamentals, it will often survive. If your marriage doesn't have strong fundamentals— and like you said, you were married for the church, then your marriage could be in jeopardy. But is that the podcast's fault? Is yeah, that yeah. the support group's fault? Is that the church's fault? Is that Joseph Smith's fault? Is that the deception, the fault of the deception? Yeah. yeah. Totally. And I feel totally. like there are um, people that I've met who um, the church has exposed that maybe the, a big reason that they got married was the church and them separating was a really good thing. So, you know, like, Sometimes divorce is good. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like villainizing or saying divorce, that means someone's failed. Like, I don't think that's right. the case. That's just a complex situation. But yeah, the podcasts, leaving the church, support groups, that's not the reason that's killing families. So I've, I've been a part of these internet Mormon communities now for 20 years. And, you know, there, there, there are some very predictable things. It's like memes, you know, anger at the church leaders, showing your first tattoos, showing your first, you know, times to drink alcohol, 
showing your first time maybe to try marijuana, talking about sexual stuff. Like, you know, these all, these are all talking about bad interactions with church leaders or weird family members, but talking about the alcohol and, you know, marijuana and tattoos and taking off your garments. Some would, some would say, see, they wanted to sin. They left the church yeah. because they wanted to drink beer or they wanted to be unfaithful to their spouse or they wanted to get a tattoo. And that just shows they never really believed in the first place. They just wanted some excuse to sin. And as soon as they found some excuse to sin, they were off sinning and they never really were committed in the first place. What would you say about those types of accusations? I would ask the person, how many people are you close to who have left the church? <laughs> Like how many stories have you been exposed to? Because that statement comes from, in my opinion, a lack of exposure. Yeah. Like Chelsea right now is trying really hard to like coffee. <laughs> and like <laughs> well, no one could. Yeah, like, that's you, another one. My first coffee. <laughs> yeah. Like you could say Chelsea and you did because you want to drink it. And it's like, no. <laughs> like It's interesting though, because that was a big or one reason that Nick, after he had stepped away from the church, that he said, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink coffee. I'm not going to do anything. So people can't weaponize yeah. that specific line on me. And I thought that was really interesting. And I'm like, Nick, just let it go. Like I still haven't tried beer. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm 20 years into my faith crisis. I've never tried it for that reason. Yeah. I don't want to. So you don't want to weaponize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I haven't tried weed. I haven't. You yeah. Know, yeah. So I just think it's a lack of exposure. A statement like that. Yeah. But that, yeah, it, it has not been lose, the case for yeah. anyone we know. The repercussions for stepping away from the church are so high that like a drink of coffee, I feel like it's just not. Or beer. Yeah. It's just not yeah. worth it with what you lose in a lot of ways. So. Yeah. The other thing that people don't realize is that if you do get a tattoo or if you do get a double ear piercing or if you do try whatever, sometimes it's just like the church, I associate now pain and hurt with the church. What were all the things that defined me as a Mormon? It's a natural reaction to then feel like you want to express yourself in non-Mormon ways. As, a, as almost a way to claim psychological independence. Yeah. So you go to the double ear piercing, you go to the tattoo, you go to the beer, you go to the marijuana, whatever, as a way to sort of declare independence. Does that make sense? Totally. Psychological Absolutely. independence. Absolutely. To, to break the conditioning, right? Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm, I just recently I've started a new job and everyone's like, where'd you go to school? BYU. And I like, I want to find something <laughs> that I can wear on my sleeve or I'm like, not, or not that'll, wear. That yeah. would say what? That would say what? <laughs> that would just indicate like, Oh, like, I mean, I don't know. Mormon missionary haircut here. Like I, I we both look very, very, yeah, meaning so I'm not that believing. type of Mormon. Yeah, I need what? something like, that would indicate that like, Oh, Nick went to BYU, but like, he's not one of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I don't know I don't what that is yet. What? Oh, exactly. Exactly. Like, I'm not one of like I'm a big a tattoo right here would say like oh he's nope <laughs> he went I went to BYU. to BYU but I'm not racist sexist or homophobic exactly I'm not judgmental I don't think I'm better than you yeah and I think everyone even members are are trying to find ways to do that as well like I feel like there's true it's just a statement to be like I am my own person but I'm also not all of those negative things that are so heavily associated with the church so. yeah. So what, okay. So Nick, why didn't you start a men's group? Well, I mean, Chelsea's doing all the women's stuff. What about the men? You're just blowing off the men. I am blowing important. off the men. <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think we're just too, uh, pretty di like Chelsea craves that community and belonging and sharing and empathizing where for me, I'm like, Oh, I need a new project to work on and, and I'll be in the garage tinkering with something. So I think personality differences and it's not your interest. Yeah. Much. It's, it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it just hasn't been. I right. know some of our meetups, um, like the Thomas Wirtha McConkie, we had uh, spouses and anyone who wanted to come. So, like, I feel like it's okay to, like, for me right now, planning meetups with men and women is a, a good thing. But the sounding board of, like, online is what I'm trying to navigate. Maybe we're big enough that it wouldn't be a problem anymore. I don't know. Yeah. But I know some women in the group have tried starting men's groups, but they have all just kind of, like, just the engagement isn't there. From what, from what I've heard. There so. is something about women's groups that have inertia, momentum, critical mass, because WACA has started men groups too. And and they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're doing okay. I don't want to speak out, you know, but I don't get the sense that the men's groups swell yeah. like the women's groups for some reason, mm -hmm. which just shows how important these women's groups are, you know, because mm -hmm. 
because we need networks. We need communities. Like one of the things the church does so well is community. And people that's because people need community. They thirst for it. And so we, as progressive and post-Mormons, have to create it. Shout out to Faith again. Shout out to, you know, Thrive. Shout out to mm-hmm. Oasis. Shout out to Facebook, ex-Mormon Reddit. Like all these places that create community are sacred. They're saving yeah. lives. They're they're saving marriages. They're healing people with anxiety and depression and feelings of isolation and brokenness. So just kudos to you guys for being a part of the solution. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that, yeah it's been Charles. And, and honestly, seeing how well women's groups thrive is just one more testament that there should be much more women's voices in the church and, and female bishops and stake presidents and yeah, that they would that be would so be, much be better amazing. at creating that community. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah, definitely. So what else about your story do you guys want to make sure and tell? You know, is there anything else about your story? So I guess you did leave the church, Chelsea. Yes, I, yeah. Was that it hard? still feels yeah. weird to say that, that I left. Is that new? Oh, it was absolutely devastating. And I know I disappointed a lot of people and people. How did you come out? Um, I, I just made a post and just said very, like, frankly, like, this isn't working for me. And I, um, and stepping away. I'm distancing myself and my family. Um, and I've tried to be very thoughtful and very tactful. Like I've never wanted to, I know what it's like to be forced into a faith transition, so to speak. And I know how uncomfortable that is. And I never want to do that because I know some families, um, timing is important and some families maybe aren't able to fully transition. And I know that can cause a lot of pain. So I never want to be like a catalyst of like, you've got to follow and like, you've got to leave. That's just not something I want to tout but um i basically just wanted to do what nick has given me the gift and i know other people have given the gift to nick of just humanizing what that journey looks like because um it is so much more thoughtful and and intentional than anything that the church ever describes it being and that there's beauty on the outside i remember coming to your thrive event uh when was that two years ago before covid a year and a couple months yeah. yeah 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 um and I felt, it felt like home. It just felt like just seeing, and I saw a few couple friends, like it just felt so good um, that there is beauty outside of the church. And I, um, I feel like that message just needs to keep getting reshared. Like there is beauty outside. Let's dive into that. So like we're conditioned to think and feel that you can't have a good marriage outside the church. You can't be a good parent outside the church. You can't raise healthy kids outside the church. If you leave the church, you'll become an alcoholic, a drug addict. You'll become sexually irresponsible. You'll become a prostitute or, you know, a sex worker or whatever. Like you can't, and, and just, you can't be happy. There's no meaning. You'll be alone. There'll be no purpose in life. Like that's how we're all conditioned. How has it been for you guys individually and as a couple? Oh, I would, I mean, as much as we just painted the intro to our marriage to be (laughs) rough and just an uphill battle, um, I don't know, going through a faith transition, and I'm sure there's other influences that have contributed to this, but just deconstructing together and going through this journey has been so phenomenal for our marriage. So anyone who's sitting there thinking, why, how I'm just like I said earlier, we, all the expectations have gone out the window and is that I, good? Oh, absolutely. Like I Not see all of the expectations. Okay, okay. Sorry. All of the Mormon expectations that a good family is supposed to look like this and this and this. Or all and of the shoulds. That's just like a marriage should be like this or a spouse should be doing this or this type of role. Like, Reevaluating, yeah. like what works for our family, mm. what works with our dynamic between our personalities. Um, like Nick has just offered to po- potentially be like a stay at home dad for a few years. If I wanted to go back to school, like just the dynamic, like we're much more flexible and less rigid and um, also more quick to say I was wrong. Like going through a faith transition is the most humbling thing. I just feel like I had so much certainty and now I'm like, wow, I was wrong about a lot of really big things. Like what else am I wrong about? It's just this humility has blessed our relationship and our family of, um, looking for ways to improve and to like Nick said earlier, like pivot, just learn new information and pivot. And there's just this liberation of pivoting and of not having to feel like 
you need to do mental gymnastics or wrestle with things that the cognitive dissonance, that things that make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But if we could be one data point for someone who's like faith crisis, oh no, our marriage is going to fall apart. Like I, we could be one data point that it has been fun. Like it was rough and it was something we really have had to work through, but uh, it's it's been been phenomenal. It's been better for your marriage. Oh yeah. Yeah. In so many ways. So, I mean, not initially, but (laughs) yeah, once again, it was hard to work through. You have to put the time in and you have to like communication. We see so many people, you see so many people, especially in your group that like communication is just lacking in their marriage. It's just a really hard thing. Yeah. And any shifting beliefs, especially when you signed up to do the, you know, one way, it's just really difficult. But I mean, there's also this added beauty of like, Nick, uh, you're not, you don't like labels, atheist, but he does not believe that there is a higher power. I wouldn't bet money on it. Yeah. And I'm still sorting through that. I would like to believe that, but I don't know where I stand, but there's this added layer of beauty of taking off those Mormon God lenses and just seeing the world very differently. Like, you know, like I'll just look at my little baby's toes and they're just so chubby and cute and I'll just start crying. So I'm like, wow, the fact that I got here out of all of the people that could have been me and all the people that could have been him, like we're here and I don't know how long we'll have together. And I don't know if we'll ever see each other like at the end of this, but like, there's just this beauty. Um, and it can sound really scary, but it's also like, yeah, it's What's new. What's the beauty? How do you describe the beauty? It's just, there's a lot of meaning. Like Nick has become a huge environmentalist because you know, uh, just the world, this earth is what we have. And, uh, he has, um, like stop eating meat and not saying you need to do all of these things yeah, to be yeah. an environmentalist, but he has made changes in his life, very substantial, large changes, um, to better, uh, or lessen his carbon footprint and to help the earth. And I've seen that as he's transitioned away from the church, that this is, has been really important to him. And I think that's a beautiful change, uh, to really, the weight and what is here and now is so big and so like amazing. Thanks. Yeah. I think, so. I think, yeah, being in the church, uh, general authorities weren't talking about like climate or things like that. And so I'm like, Oh, well it must not matter. There must be some way that the second coming is just going to fix all that. Um, so yeah, in a lot of ways, uh, this has just enabled us to become our own people uh, rather than relying on the church to tell us what we should be interested in or not. and Yeah, or spend our time thinking about yeah. and just be more curious about how other people operate and live. And anyway, and just realizing how wrong we are all the time about lots of things. And we're always going to be wrong about lots of things. So anyway. Yeah. So, so both of you were kind of uber Mormons before getting married. And one of the things I've sometimes seen is like the really hardcore Uber Mormons really have a hard time when they lose the structure and they can get lost. You can get lost yeah. in yeah. alcohol, drugs, sexual exploration, just identity stuff. It can be so devastating that you were super strong with the armor and with the protection, with the skeleton of the church. But then when it's all gone, some people just turn into a blob uh, of, of, uh, meaninglessness or, or lack of structure, or too much freedom. Kind of like you cut the string on the kite mm. and the kite falls to the ground. It seems like you guys have avoided that sort of total collapse. And I'm just wondering how that happened given how uber Mormon you both were. Yeah. I, well, so far we've avoided that collapse. Yeah, just follow up in a year. No, I think a lot of that has been exposure to other people who've gone through this path before. So uh, like that Faith Again group, um, there were a couple of Facebook groups, well, just the resources of people like the therapists or things that have been helpful for them and their reconstruction, you know, books yeah. or so what resources have been useful therapists, books, therapists, groups. Yeah. Share, groups. Share yeah. Yeah. And just give details though. I'll give details. Um, uh, ones you can, let's see. Uh, so thoughtful faith is still around. I know that they're not meeting up in person, but that'll change soon. Yeah. Uh, is, that the, is that the Waters of Mormon group? Or Sorry, did I say? Faith, faith. faith again. So, faith sorry, again. I meant faith, faith again. again. Faith that again. Yep, resource. that was important. Okay. A Thoughtful Faith is another one that I was involved in uh, for several years. A Facebook group. Now it's called yeah. Waters of Mormon. Yep. It's yeah. a group for people trying to stay in the church. Yeah, it's become a little bit more people staying in where when it was named a Thoughtful Faith, 
I, it seemed to play a little bit more toward those who were kind of struggling at the fringes and potentially on their way out. I started that group. Yeah. I mean, congrats. Th and thank you very <laughs> much. They kicked me out. Yeah, yeah. But only because I didn't fit the mission. Yeah, and, and, and I've kind of stopped participating in that uh, group so much. But but I so I'm sure the landscape has shifted. Chelsea's group is this for a lot of people. Well, I'll say one resource, Symmetry Solutions. That has been huge. We started... What is that? Uh, a group of therapists, they specialize uh, in faith transitions, sex therapy. Natasha Helper Parker started it, right? And with a group of um, other women. And I, Janice Spangler. Janice Spangler's in there. We went to um, Sunstone. That was one of the first things of then you get exposed to a bunch of different um, authors and historians um, and therapists. And so that's where we got exposed to Symmetry Solutions. And so Janice Spangler is who I have connected with, and she has amazing resources on like Richard Rohr um, and his the reconstruction of the second half of life. That's been really helpful. We interviewed her yesterday. Yeah, we talked about that. She's fantastic, yeah. and she um, actually invited me to a Zoom Sunday or Sunday sacrament meeting thing with Gina Colvin, um, and she like blessed the sacrament. And I did not Gina know did. how much I needed to see that. Yeah. And it was just such a gift. It was just like this, this network of just connecting with people who can cr uh, provide opportunities for you to see and be exposed to new people and new ideas and meditation. Um, and there's lots of retreats. Uh, with who? Um, like I went to a retreat at Womb Sisters. Um, Anyway, and it's all about just uh, divine feminine and trying to get reconnected to yourself and your beliefs. And um, however that translates, whether that's in the church or not, that was kind of helpful. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah. I'm Any other books or podcasts? Podcasts. Um, Mormon stories, if you've heard of Mormon <laughs> stories, has, has been great. Um, I've actually been branching out. So, I mean, Glenna Doyle Untamed is always one that will top the charts. Yeah. I've, and, um, Brene Brown, uh, I've been loving Jedediah Jenkins. Um, he's an author and he talks about what it was like. He was an evangelical, but the parallels, like I'm loving learning <clears throat> from other religions and people who grew up in other sects of like Christianity and how that has impacted their lives. Um, so <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. But yeah, Jedediah Jenkins is someone I'm loving right now, and he, he just released his second book, um, talking all about like the ego and your identity. That's something I'm super interested in, and realizing like how, where do I stop or start, and the church starts and stops. You know, like I don't know, I don't know who I am, and that's something I'm trying to explore. So. Yeah. Because the church was so much of our identities. And I mean, you look at us, our sense of humor, we're still very Mormon. I think we'll always be pretty Mormon. <laughs> Um, and we'll own that, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, how, however, wherever you find that community, I think that was very important for both of us to, to seek out and find other people who've been through this before. It's, it's so easy to just slip into rage, anger, and which are good things. And I'm still, Oh, totally. Feeling. We both went through, uh, yeah. Um, stages of grief. But, but to like help move through those feelings and other people like their wisdom and experience, yeah, I, I feel like can help do that. Yep. Um, Just exposure to people who've been through it and how they've landed. You know, and like in this Facebook group of the Faith Journey meetups, like there'll be women who will share their templates of the emails that they sent their parents so that other people can use what they would like from the email. Like just like these little gifts along the way of people who can help make it slightly more comforting. <laughs> you know, and, uh, so, and just like the, the best coffee shops in town or where to start. And like, you know, just like people who can just like handhold, cause the church is really good about handholding and beliefs. Like just having a few hands to hold as you find your own is really helpful. So. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been super amazing. I'm so grateful, Chelsea and Nick, that you guys are willing to tell your story and I'm grateful for all you've done to help create community. Um, for people who need it. Uh, and I'm glad to know you're so close and maybe we can partner and do some events yeah. or support each other because I'm always just trying to find ways to help people and you guys are too. So let's, let's collaborate if, if ever there's a way we can help each other. Awesome. Yeah. We'd Definitely. love that. Thank you for having us. Any final, I'll give you each just kind of a chance to give a final closing statement 
of encouragement or support or of, of belief or conviction or whatever you want to say, closing statements. Yeah. I don't know. Hope you can give people hope. Yeah. Just for me, there is so much more than what you might, if you can currently find yourself on the good ship Zion thinking I can't jump because I will lose everything I have. I absolutely was in that boat and felt that same way and felt that there was nothing beyond Mormonism and everything I need is in this boat. And why would I, even if there is a tiny little crack, why would I focus on that when I have everything that I need? And uh, I, w- I would just say, yeah, I don't know. There's just so, so much more beauty Um and complexity and value and love and community on other boats in the sea, in the sea itself, wherever you might find yourself, that uh, if you find yourself thinking, I can't leave this because I would lose out on X, Y, Z, my testimony is that there is so much more in the world. And uh, yeah. So much to gain. Yeah, so much to gain for sure. Mine would just be that there are people here that are interested in helping you. If you're listening to this and if you've made it even through any of it, um, thank you. (laughs) But also that we're here for you. And there are people who are cheering you on and who think that you are amazing and smart and thoughtful. And to question your beliefs is a really brave and courageous thing to do. So, yeah. And if someone wants to join your group, they have to be a woman. Be a woman, um, (laughs) non-binary, and just search the term Faith Journey Meetups, and I will add you. Okay. So, yeah. All Um, right. Thanks, John. Well, thanks again so much for coming. You guys are great. Keep up the good work. Stay in touch. Shout out to uh, Tyler and um, Carly Alden, who let me know about you guys. And... uh, Appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, thanks so much to everyone who supports uh, Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. Unfortunately, only like one out of a thousand of our listeners actually support. So if you find value in this,